everything is fine now and I'm glad uh, uh, um, people can join now our meeting so uh, we can start with a few minutes uh, late. So I would like to welcome uh, all of you to our second uh, session uh, together with Kamal Hajian. Uh, I'm your host uh, today. My name is uh, Jutta Kunz and uh, we are having the second session on black holes and alternative theories. And I suggest we start right away. And uh, our first speaker, uh, Manu uh, Srivastava. Manu, is he here? Ah, yes, yes, I'm here. Very good, thank you. Uh, uh, please share the screen. Mm, yeah. And uh, he will tell us uh, about analytical computation of quasi-normal modes uh, of slowly rotating black holes and dynamical transignments theory. Please, uh, Manu. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, so I'll be uh, today. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, today. I'll be talking about uh, my work with. Uh, uh, Professor Jan Bichin at Caltech and Professor S. Shankar Narayan at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. And the work is titled Analytical Computation of Quasi-Normal Modes for Rotating Black Holes in DCS Gravity. So, oh, no, this is not changing. Huh? Okay. So, the, as we know, the, there are several propositions to modifications to general relativity, which is GR. And one such strong field modification is the dynamic Chern Simmons modified gravity theory, which I'll call as the DCS modified theory. So the question we asked was that can gravitational wave observation distinguish between say GR and DCS theory? That is, we have a slowly rotating black hole solution in GR, which is the Kerr black hole. And we also have a rotating solution in DCS gravity. So is there a way that current or even future observations uh, can distinguish whether the source of the gravitational waves is more accurately described by the Kerr solution or is it uh, more accurately described by the DCS solution. So one way is via their quasi-normal mode frequencies. And so what we did in our work is we computed the quasi-normal mode frequencies of a slowly rotating solution, which was proposed by Eunice and Pretorius in 2009 for this DCS theory. And so just a quick recap of quasi-normal mode frequencies. Uh, we know that uh, for a stretch string, we perturb a stretch string, we'll get a perturbation equation. And you solve the perturbation equations, you apply some boundary conditions. And it, these boundary conditions and the equation is such that it forces the solutions to have only some very discrete values of frequencies. And it so turns out that the frequencies, the discrete frequencies in the string case are purely real, which uh, suggests that the system is conservative. If we uh, draw the same analogy with the black hole, uh, we perturb a black hole, we'll get a perturbation equation, we apply some boundary conditions, and again, I mean, on the solutions, and again, these boundary conditions are such that they force the solutions to sustain only some very discrete values of frequencies. Only in this case, the frequencies are complex and which suggests that the system is dissipated. And since the frequencies are complex, instead of calling them the normal modes, like what we call in the stretch string case, we call them the quasi-normal mode. And the, uh, and the boundary conditions, like in the stretch string case, we could have the Dirichlet boundary conditions where the displacement at the two endpoints is zero. Similarly, the boundary condition for the black hole is, uh, for, is I tried to describe that in this figure. Close to the horizon, the nothing can come out of the horizon. So all the perturbations are only ingoing. Whereas at infinity, this blue line is signifying infinity. At infinity, all the perturbations have to be purely outgoing. So these boundary conditions force uh, the solutions of this perturbation equation to have discrete complex frequencies, which we call the quasi-normal mode frequency. And just to highlight that these uh, quasi-normal modes are property of the system and not of the perturbation, just like the normal modes in the string. So which part of the gravitational wave signal is sensitive to quasi-normal mode frequencies is uh, I, uh, only the ring down part of the signal, only in the ring down case after two black holes have merged and they, formed, they have formed a remnant black hole, only this phase we can treat it as a linear perturbed black hole. 
and only this part of the signal, the ring down signal, is what uh, can be used to infer the quasi normal mode frequency. So, uh, I'll structure the talk in the following way. I'll give a very quick overview of the DCS theory. Then I'll describe the slowly rotating solution uh, we are studying. And then there are a few steps of calculating these quasi normal mode frequencies. And towards the end, I'll discuss some results with some observational implications. So, let's begin with the DCS overview. Now, the DCS uh, action can be written as an equation one in the absence of any external matter. In the DCS theory, we have an external field, and therefore the action has one piece is the standard Einstein Hilbert action. Then there is this S theta, which is just, uh, if you see here, it is just the Lagrangian, the scalar field Lagrangian in uh, the usual scalar field Lagrangian. And the, the part that distinguishes uh, DCS from GR is this SCS part of the action where the scalar field is coupled to something called the Pontry agent density, R star R. And Pontry agent density is nothing but some uh, contraction of Riemann tensor along with the levi civita tensor. So this alpha is, the, is what I call the Chern-Simmons uh, coupling parameter. And uh, the value of alpha should uh, describe how much deviation from GR there is. When alpha is equal to zero, the theory is GR. When uh, the stronger alpha gets, the more deviation from GR. So the field equations for the action, DCS actions are six and seven. If we vary with respect to the metric, we get equation six, which is just like the Einstein's equation, except for this DC, uh, the C tensor. And C tensor is related to the background theta via these Bs and the background metric via these uh, Ricci and Riemann tensors. And the scalar field equation, what we have done is we have set this potential to zero in our work. So the scalar field equation is just box theta is minus alpha by four beta into the Pontry agent density. Now, an interesting fact about the DCS theory is that the short shell black hole solution and the FRW solutions, which are solutions of GR, are also solutions of the DCS theory. And since FRW is a FRW solution, FRW is a solution, and therefore DCS has implications even for cosmology. And uh, now the slowly rotating solutions that we'll be studying is, uh, as I mentioned, the short shell and FRW are solutions of the, DC, uh, of the DCS theory. But the rotating solution in GR, which is the Kerr black hole, it turns out that this is no longer a solution of the DCS theory. And till date, there has not been any closed form arbitrarily rotating solution found in the DCS case. What people have done is that they have solved these field equations uh, perturbatively in different orders of spin. And one of uh, the one of the solutions that they have got, or uh, one of the solutions is Eunice and Pretorius got, well, is uh, given in equation nine. Now, if you see the, uh, the metric, the ds square sr is just the slowly rotating curve metric, which is given in equation 10. And if you see the difference between these two, it is only in the dt d phi term. The chern simmons solution is different from the GR solution only in the dt d phi term. And even this, if you see the structure, this has sine square theta dt d phi. This has sine square theta dt d phi. So the structure is very similar. What has happened is only this R dependent coefficient of the dt d phi part has changed. Now this similarity in the structure was very important uh, for us because uh, for the quasi normal mode frequencies for the slowly rotating Kerr black hole, which is this equation 10, have already been computed. So because they are similar in structure, we had a direction going forward that what all should be done. Although there are some, there were some very non-trivial modifications we had to make to the GR procedure, but at least we had a direction to going forward. And for the DCS theory, along with the metric, we also need the system is described by a field configuration also. And therefore, for this solution, the corresponding field configuration is given in equation 11. And just to note, these solutions are accurate to linear order in spin and quadratic order in the chern simmons coupling parameter. And what we did in our work is we computed the quasi-normal mode frequencies of this particular solution. So to compute the quasi-normal mode frequencies, the first step is to perturb the metric. So we perturb the metric as in equation 12. And as we know, the perturbation can be classified into odd and even cases based on how they transform under parity. And uh, what, uh, just to mention that we work in a particular gauge, which is the Rege Wheeler gauge. And in the Rege Wheeler gauge, we just uh, decompose these odd and even perturbations in terms of some spherical harmonics and their derivatives. 
and the scalar field is decomposed in the standard way where it is capital R by R Y L M into exponential I omega T. Now this harmonic time dependence we also assume in our Rajewiller gauge. So if you imagine we put these perturbations back in our field equations, the perturbation equations will depend on t, r, theta, and phi. But because of this harmonic dependence in time, the t part can be cancelled out, can be removed. So the equation remains in r and the angular coordinates. And the next step is to eliminate these angular dependences and get purely radial equations. And once we have the radial equations, there the Further, the next step is combining those radial equations to get Schrodinger-like form, Schrodinger-like equations. So I'll describe these two steps together as they are very interconnected. So first step is to means uh, to remove the to eliminate the angular dependence. What Kojima showed in his 1992 paper is uh, he gave a very detailed and elaborate method of uh, eliminating all those angular dependences in the GR case. Now what we realized is that for the DCS case. Uh, we need a, a Kojima-like procedure, but there are several extra terms that we need to take care apart from this Kojima-like procedure. So what Kojima had done was that in the GR case there are ten independent equations. So he had based on how, uh, what are what is their structure, uh, their angular dependence structure. He had clubbed them into three groups of four plus four plus two. Now in our case we have an extra field equation. And what we realized is that field equation, the angular structure is such that it can be very easily fit in the first group, first Kojima's group. So we have 11 equations for the DCS case in groups of 5 plus 4 plus 2. And it so turns out that uh, the entire procedure of Kojima, for which is which he described for the GR uh, theory, uh, it it goes through as it is for the DCS case for the 5 plus 4 equations. That is the first two groups. Is the uh, the functions as such change, but the whole procedure remains invariant. But these last two equations, the last set of two equations, is uh, uh, these don't. There are several extra and non-trivial terms from which we had to eliminate angular dependences, and these non-trivial modifications uh, to account for them, we had to use some properties of the spinorial harmonics and the ladder operators in spin-weighted spherical harmonics and other things which the details I won't say I, I won't mention but uh, just that there is uh, we need some extra pieces apart from the Kojima procedure to remove the angular dependences and after eliminating the angular dependences the 11 equations are of the following form now here anything that is p is uh, is related to polar functions is related to the polar sector Anything that is A is the axial sector functions and anything that is S is the scalar field functions. So what we see is that there are out of the 11 equations, 7 equations turn out to be only in the polar coordinate, polar function. 3 equations which are axial equations uh, are, uh, are, there are these 3 axial equations but they are coupled to the scalar field equation, uh, coupled to the scalar field. Similarly, the scalar field equation is coupled to the axial sector. So what we see is that the polar sector is completely decoupled, whereas the axial sector and the scalar field are coupled to each other. And uh, to combine these together, I, I said we need to combine them into Schrodinger like master equations. To combine them together for the GR case, uh, there is a standard GR procedure that people use for quasi normal mode calculations of slow rotating curve black hole. Now what we had to do is that we faced a problem to which we had to find some solution and only after finding that solution we could employ the standard GR procedure and that problem had to do with some higher derivative terms at perturbative order. If these alpha square terms had some higher order derivatives as compared to the zeroth order term and which uh, makes the perturbation very unstable. Now I'll, I'll skip this comment in the interest of time. So the final equations that we got after combine after combining these into uh, see or these seven equations into one master equation that describes the polar perturbation and combining these three into one axial equation the final equation that we got was uh, equation 18 and 19 and uh, equation 18 as you see is uh, the size z is complete is the polar master variable um, uh, polar master function and as you see it is size z here size z here size z here it is complete it is uh, completely independent of any axial or scalar field function so as we had seen earlier the polar equation is completely decoupled from the axial and polar uh, axial and theta sector 
whereas the axial equation you see the psi regevi uh, psi rw is what is my uh, axial master function and uh, it is coupled to the scalar field function r uh, as a source term so these equations if we said uh, what i have done is express the express spin as uh, a dimensionless parameter chi and i have expressed the chernsimans coupling parameter as alpha tilde which is again dimensionless now if i said alpha tilde is equal to 0 in this equation there is alpha dependence here and alpha dependence here so if i set alpha is equal to 0 this will turn out to be the famous derili equation and if i turn alpha is equal to 0 here this will turn out to be the famous regevilar equation for short shell black hole because at uh, at spin is equal to 0 short shell is also a solution of the dcs theory now once we have these uh, perturbation equations the next step is how do we compute the quasi normal mode frequencies from these solutions and for that we employ a perturbation scheme very analogous or very similar to uh, the per time independent perturbation theory that is done in quantum mechanics so what we do is uh, we cast the we cast this polar equation in the following form in the form of equation 20 where op is all the things which are spin independent which are chi independent that is in this equation if i said chi is equal to 0 whatever is left is there in this op operator which is d by dr star square minus some potential p whatever is chi dependent i put in my vp which this behaves like uh, some perturbing potential and this rho square comes from this omega square when we take on the right hand side rho square acts as my eigen value so it's like there is a hamiltonian there is a perturbing potential and then there is an eigen value very analogous to the schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics and we use exactly the same time independent perturbation theory method we expand psi in terms of power of the uh, powers of chi which is our perturbing uh, parameter similarly we expand the eigen value in terms of chi and the final solution uh, the final uh, the first uh, first order correction to our eigen value what we get is very analogous to uh, that in quantum mechanics where if you see the first order correction is given by psi perturbing potential into psi divided by uh, psi psi inner product now the non trivial analysis here was the definition of inner product in the usual quantum mechanics case the hamiltonian was already hermitian now what we had to do is we had to define an inner product in such a way that our and uh, the op operator here becomes self adjoint and only then we get a simple formula like this and uh, one and but after means once we have defined the inner product then things are very clear it is just evaluation of some integral and for evaluation of the first order correction we need the zeroth order eigen values and the eigen functions and zeroth order eigen functions as i told before are just the short shell eigen functions which are setting spin is equal to 0 short shell is the dcs solution also and the short shell eigen functions and frequencies have been calculated in many places in the literature and one of them is the continued famous continued fraction method by lever and for the polar cases we also use the chandrashekhar transformation so final results what we arrived at is uh, we computed the first order uh, we computed the quasi normal modes accurate to linear order in spin and quadratic order in alpha completely for the polar case where uh, if you see omega i gr ai is the short shell uh, quasi normal mode contribution bi is the gr spin correction and ci is the correction due to the dcs due to dcs theory and uh, but Uh, if you see what if we employ our technique for the axial sector what we could do is we could uh, what we could not do is we could not account for these uh, uh, coupling with the scalar field so in principle what we should have done is uh, take all this to the left hand side and include that in our perturbing potential here and that perturbing potential there would have then would have some extra terms and there would be some extra contribution to this correction and uh, therefore that extra contribution i have written as this di theta this is some contribution due to the scalar field coupling but apart from the scalar field coupling we have computed part of the correction which was due to these uh, extra alpha square term this, this term and the alpha square contribution here so uh, for the polar case we have the complete quasi normal mode frequency whereas for the axial case we have only computed part of the correction and uh, this di theta calculation is uh, scope for future work
So observational relevance, uh, very quickly I'll mention is that uh, some very recent data in 2001 itself, uh, there is this neutron star interior data by Silva et al, which constrains the churn simmons parameter to be around 8.5 kilometers. And uh, what, what for, a ch for a 15 solar mass black hole, this constraint translates to alpha tilde to be about uh, 0.1. And for this value of uh, alpha tilde, when we compute the ratio of uh, the chun simmons correction with the GR correction, we find that the chun simmons correction is significant when compared to the GR correction. So therefore, in future observations, when the signal to noise ratio uh, improves a little, there are good chances of uh, finding, being able to distinguish these corrections. And uh, just uh, very quickly, last point is that uh, of other observational relevance is that if you see the Chern Simmons correction, when it is added to the, the background, uh, the zeroth order solution, what it is doing to the imaginary part is it is reducing the magnitude. And once the imaginary part magnitude decreases, it means the decay rate of the wave is decreasing. Uh, so when the decay rate is lower, there are more chances of detection. So these were just the observational and just very quickly the conclusions we have been able to compute the quasi normal mode frequencies the accurate to linear order in spin and uh, quadratic order in alpha square modulo this di theta coefficient and uh, just a final word is that these tools and techniques that we used in this metric formalism uh, where we discuss we perturbatively expanded the uh, the metric uh, the field equations though these techniques when we go to higher and faster spinning solutions there are several caveats that will uh, pop up and therefore we need to evolve something like a newman penrose formalism to deal with higher spinning solutions okay that's it from my end thank you yeah thank you very much uh, uh, for this very interesting talk uh, in view of time i would say we have time for a brief question is there some brief question i don't see any raised hand at the moment um from my side uh, i have a, a brief question namely oh, yeah okay. uh, the l equals to two modes so the quadrupolar modes but you would also have dipolar modes did you also oh. look at that Oh, could you repeat the question? I could not understand. Um, you have just looked, uh, shown us results for the quadrupole mode. L mm -hmm. But uh, since you have uh, a scalar field, um, a pseudo scalar field, do you also have uh, looked at uh, the lower modes, uh, dipole modes, L equal to one? Oh, oh, oh okay. So the, our, the analysis we could, uh, what these results I have shown here are only for L is equal to two, but the whole procedure works for any value of L. The one of the interesting things is that these extra terms, which I was showing for these uh, Kojima like terms, which I had, these, there are these extra terms, which uh, maybe I these extra terms for L less than two, they don't arise. Only for L greater than equal to two, these extra terms are there. So we did analyze the L is equal to one and uh, the lower modes also, but uh, just for displaying the solution, uh, the results here i have just put in the eligible to two more okay thank you uh so uh thanks again for this uh, interesting talk and um, let's go to thank our second so speaker uh joao um rosa i am here from uh, tattoo okay yes. very good and uh, please share your screen and now we will hear about scalar perturbations of curved black holes and hybrid metric Platini gravity. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a work I've done in collaboration with uh, my two ex-PhD supervisors, uh, José Lems and Francisco Lop, uh, that was published last year. Here is the, the reference. If you find this, uh, this work interesting, please take a look. And uh, if you have any comments or suggestions, please let me know. So um, the motivation for me, of course, this is probably the same as for anyone working in modified gravity. One must explain if GR is so successful, why do we need modified gravity? And the thing is that GR, uh, despite being so successful, it presents a few problems, like uh, it doesn't give you a quantum description of gravity. It requires on dark matter and dark energy 
for the, the cosmological um, standard model. So it's something that you do not understand at a fundamental level, etc. So you usually try to solve these problems by recurring to modified gravity. Um, there are many ways of modifying gravity. There are two main ways of doing so, which, which are by the addition of extra fields, either scalar, vectorial, or tensorial, or even by the addition of uh, higher order terms, like it happens for, for f of r and for gauss bonnet gravity, for example. And sometimes these two modifications, they are connected to each other, like it happens, for example, between f of r and scalar tensor theories. So modified gravity comes as, um, as some way to try to solve the problems of, uh, of GR. The modified theory of gravity I'm going to explore in this talk is the Abri metropolitan gravity. This theory is, uh, is motivated by the fact that a few years ago, this theory was able to unify, to, to unify the, the cosmological acceleration with the solar system constraints without having to, to recur to the, to the chameleon effect. So in such a way, okay, it's, it's good that it, it provides this unification, but I don't think this is enough to, to say that the, the modified, a modified theory of gravity is, um, is a successful alternative. A modified theory of gravity must be able to replicate all the things that GR does correctly uh, and also solve the problem. So one thing that I decided to check is, okay, this theory is very nice at a cosmological level, but does it explain the metastability of, of uh, black holes in a cosmological time scale? Well, let's have a look. So to introduce the theory, let me start by presenting you the action. This theory is very similar to f of r, but with the difference that instead of having just one Ricci scalar, we have two Ricci scalars. We have the normal Ricci scalar, let's say the one that depends on the metric G, and then we have the Palatini Ricci scalar. The Palatini Ricci scalar is written in terms of a, an independent connection, let's call it gamma hat, which, which does not depend on the metric G. Now you have two independent variables in this action, the metric G and the independent connection gamma hat, so you can take two equations of motion. The first equation of motion is the one you obtain by varying this action with respect to the metric, and this is pretty much the, the modified field equations. As you can see, if you are familiar with f of r, this is very, very similar to f of r, with the exception that we have one extra term. So if you choose, for example, a metric formulation of, uh, of f of r, this term disappears and you get the rest. If you choose a Palatini formulation of f of r, this term and this term disappear and you get the, the rest. In here, you combine the two. So the Abri metric Palatini gravity simply combines the metric and the Palatini approaches to f of r in one single theory. The second equation is the one you obtain by varying the action with respect to the, to the independent connection. Actually, this is not the equation that arises. The one that arises is this one, which is very sim similar to the one you obtain in, uh, in Palatini f of r gravity. And this equation implies that there must be some other metric, let's call it HAB, for example, which is conformally related to the metric GAB with a conformal factor given by the derivative of f with respect to the Palatini scalar. And for this metric HAB, the independent connection is Levi Civita. So although you assume the two things to be independent, the metric G and the connection to be independent, this equation shows you that there is some conformal relation between the two. And so the Ricci tensor and the Palatini Ricci tensor, they must be connected to each other via conformal relation, which is exactly what we have here. Since this equation is easier to deal with than this one, this is the one we're going to keep. Now we are interested, as I said before, in checking if black holes are stable against perturbations in this, uh, in this framework. So let's take, for example, a curved black hole. And the good thing is that if you choose a vacuum spacetime, like, uh, like the curved black hole or the Schwarzschild black hole, or really any vacuum spacetime, any solution that you know in GR will be also a solution of the Abri metropolitan gravity. So you don't need to find a new solution for a black hole. You can just take a black hole in GR, insert it into the field equations of the Abri metropolitan and uh, do, your, do your work. So this is the, cur the metric for the curved black hole. This is a complicated metric, but I, I'm pretty sure you have seen it at least once uh, before. Uh, let me just provide you a um, pictorial example of what the, the curved black hole is. You have an horizon, spherical horizon in here. This is a, a surface that works as a one, di one directional membrane. You can enter the horizon and not come back. You have an ergo region, which is a region around the black hole where you are always, any observer is always co-rotating with the black hole. And inside you have a ring singularity. To understand better what is the, the causal structure of this space, I'm also presenting you the Penrose diagram. 
in here, this line R plus is the event horizon. And as you can see, if you are moving in this, uh, in this uh, Penrose diagram, you can cross the horizon inwards, but you cannot come back. So this is really a one directional membrane. But cool thing is that you can actually cross the, the ring singularity and then end up in, a, let's say, in a parallel asymptotic space. -time. Now, what we want to do is to take this space time, perturb it, so we induce a perturbation in the metric, GAB is the metric, GAB bar is the background given by this expression, and you induce a perturbation in the metric where this epsilon is a small parameter. And furthermore, to simplify the problem, you choose to work in the Lorentz cage. This simplifies the equations a lot, so this is what we, are, what we use to, to make the problem dealable, let's say. Now, what do you obtain? Remember that you have a field equation and you have um, the equation of motion for the connection. You insert this metric, you perturb this metric, and in the end, what do you get? Well, what you get is something like this. Your perturbation in the metric propagates itself to a perturbation in these ruffle symbols that propagate in the perturbation in the Riemann tensor and so on and so forth. So in the end, you have equations for the perturbation in the Ricci scalar induced by this perturbation in the metric. And the equation that governs the perturbation in the Ricci scalar is a biharmonic equation for a massive scalar field. So you have, uh, this, this would be an harmonic equation since you have two terms, it's called the biharmonic. And this is pretty much a Klein-Gordon equation for a massive scalar field. Now, equations of this type have already been studied in GR for in, in a background of a, of a curved black hole. And we know that equations of this time with just one, um, just one harmonic, harmonic, um, one harmonic factor, we know that equations of this time are pretty problematic because they induce superadient instabilities. The mass of the scalar field somehow works as a mirror. And so you are via the superradiant, the superradiant process, you are always amplifying your perturbation up to a point where the per per perturbation is so big, it cannot be considered a perturbation anymore. And this leads to a process called a black hole bomb. So these instabilities are a problem in GR. Let's see if they are a problem here as well. But to do so, let's understand the fundamentals of how this works. So let's take this perturbation delta R and let's write it in this form. Let's separate this perturbation into a radial part, an angular part, and an harmonic part where omega is the frequency of the perturbation and m is the azimuthal number. Furthermore, in the previous equation, let's induce this, um, this um, coordinate transformation. This R star is usually called the tortoise coordinate in, um, in, black, hole, in black hole physics. And for simplicity, let's also induce this, um, this transformation sorry, this transformation in the, in, the radial, in the radial function that also simplifies the problem. So if you do these ansets and these transformations, what you get is an equation that looks like this. So your perturbation, or actually the radial part of your perturbation, this U is just the radial part, the radial function. This, um, this equation, this perturbation can be described by an equation that looks pretty much like the, the Schrodinger equation in one dimension with a given potential barrier. And the problem is exactly this potential barrier. Because if you plot this potential barrier, this is what you see. And the biggest problem, the one that causes all the instabilities is this potential well. If you have some superradiant mode that is, which, uh, which is increasing in amplitude as time passes by, and this, uh, this mode is trapped inside a potential well, then it's going to stay there forever, be amplified over and over and over until it leads to an instability. So you need to get rid of this potential well in order to have black holes as stable systems. There are two ways of solving this problem. The first way is by choosing a massless uh, perturbation because the, the, the asymptotic value of this, uh, of this potential well is actually the value of the mass, this mu from the previous slide. So if you choose a perturbation that is somehow massless, then the potential well disappears and the solutions become naturally stable. But this is not the only solution. There is one more way of getting rid of this potential well. It is by increasing the mass. If you increase the mass of the potential or the mass of the perturbation, the minimum of the potential well starts increasing up to a point where when the field is too massive, the potential well actually disappears. And so again, even though the perturbation is massive, in the end, you end up with, uh, with a stable solution again. So the only two possibilities is if your mass, mass uh, parameter is zero or if your mass parameter is bigger than some critical value for which the potential well disappears. 
Now, what is the value for which the potential well disappears? Well, it has been computed by uh, Sahar Hot. And the result is this, it is proportional to the angular speed of the event horizon and also the azimuthal param parameter. And then it also depends on the mass of the black hole and the radius of the event horizon, but there is, it is a limited value. So if you choose a mass parameter that is bigger than this, your solution will be stable. Now, what are these mass parameters? Well, the mass parameters, they appeared in the previous equation as I showed you, but they are not just random constants. These mass parameters depend on the form of the function that you choose. Remember, your action is defined by a function of R, uh, the Ricci scalar, and the Palatini Ricci scalar. And if you choose a given form of this function, this given form of this function will give you a given form of the mass, uh, where the mass is explicitly given by this. this. There are two parameters, A and B, and these two parameters are given by the derivatives of the function F. So the question is, can you choose particular forms of the function f, so particular forms of the theory for which these two conditions are satisfied? And the answer is, as I'm going to show you, yes. So let me put again here the, um, the forms of the masses and let me plot the parameter space of A and B for, for these masses. So there are a few regions of this parameter space we can immediately exclude. For example, we can exclude this region here because in this region, the masses are complex. And if the masses are complex, this leads to tachyonic instability. So let's forget about this. Furthermore, there are two regions here where the masses are negative, or at least one of the masses is negative. And masses that are negative, they never exceed the critical mass. So again, if you are trying to exceed the critical mass to produce a, uh, a stable system, this region of the parameter space is not, is not uh, interesting. So what are the acceptable solutions? Well, those are the ones that stay in this region right here. So there are, as I said before, two possibilities. Either the, either the masses are zero or the masses are above a critical value. So let's make combinations. Either you choose uh, the function f in such a way that both masses are zero. If you do so from this equation, you'll get that a and b are zero and you are actually in the center of this parameter space. You can have one of the masses bigger than zero and bigger than the, the critical value. And the other mass equals to zero, which is a combination that gives you B equals zero and A negative. So in this case, you would be in this horizontal line here. And of course, there's a third possibility, which is both of the masses being greater than the critical mass. But if you look into this, uh, into this equation here, you will see that the only possibility to increase arbitrarily the value of these masses and still have the two masses above a critical value is if b is proportional to a squared. Because if b is proportional to a in a power different from two, this term either diverges or goes to zero, either becomes complex or, or goes to zero. So in the end, the only possibility is if b is proportional to a squared, in which case the masses become something like this. If I choose b equals a constant c times a squared, the masses become something like this. So if I fix a mass c, uh, uh, a constant c, and I, e, and I decrease the value of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this A right here, negative, and I decrease it as far as I can, I can have both masses arbitrarily large, which is exactly what I expect. But remember, this is always in uh, parabolic lines on the left side of this plot. Now, what are the results? Let's uh, take this, uh, these values of, uh, of A and B, these values of mu. Let's insert these values into these equations. You choose A equals something, B equals something, and you have pretty much um, partial differential equations for the function f. And you can solve these partial differential equations and find what are the forms of f for which the masses are either zero or bigger than the critical value. And these are the results. So if you want your mass to be zero, one of the masses zero and the other bigger than the critical value, or both bigger than the critical value, these are the forms of the function f that you have to choose. These values, a1, a2, a3, and four and a5, they are just constants. They can be whatever you want, but the dependency of the function in R and R, um, uh, the Ricci scalar and the Palatini Ricci scalar must be something of this type. If you choose a function like this, then you guarantee that the masses, the mass parameters that appear in your biharmonic equation are either zero or greater than any critical value that you can choose. And this implies that the, the solution for your curved black hole is stable. Now, these are the simplest forms of the function that you can choose, but notice that in the previous slide, these parameters a and b only depend on derivatives of the function f up to second order. You have second derivative with respect to curly r, second derivative with respect to r, or cross derivative, 
but they are all only up to second order. Since uh, for, for curved black holes, the Ricci scalar is equal to zero, then it means that you can take these forms of the function f and add any other higher order terms that you want, because when you take the derivatives, these higher order terms, you replace them by the value of Ricci equals to zero and these terms disappear. So this is just the simplest forms of the function f that solve the problem. But if you take these forms and add anything of order three or more, the solution will still provide, um, the, the function will still provide black hole solutions that are stable. So to conclude, uh, what we show, what we have shown in this, uh, in this work is that uh, Kerr and Schwarzschild and pretty much any solution in general relativity with a vanishing Ricci scalar, um, they are also solutions of the, um, of the Iron Metropolitan gravity. So we took Kerr and Schwarzschild as particular examples. We have shown that taking the Lorentz gauge simplifies the, the, the two equations that we have to solve immensely. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, this means that we are only studying the stability against the scalar degree of freedom. So this is somehow a first step to proving the full stability of the, of the Kerr solution, but it's not a complete study of stability. We need to drop the Lorentz gauge if you want to prove the entire stability of spacetime. And the biggest conclusion is that there are indeed particular forms of the Abri metropolitanic gravity for which Kerr solutions are stable in this uh, particular degree of freedom and this scalar degree of freedom of the field. Now, of course, there's a lot of things to do. First thing we, we, we can do, and this is exactly what I, what I just said, we can drop the Lorentz gauge and try to study the full set of tensorial perturbations. This is a very, very massive, uh, massively difficult thing to do. We are still trying to understand how to do it because the equations, the perturbation equations become of sixth order. And so we are still, well, banging our heads against the wall to, to try to solve the problem, but uh, let's see how it goes. And of course, we, we have chosen the current the Schwarzschild solution because they have R equals zero and when the Ricci scalar equals zero, equals zero. And so they are easily solutions of the Abri Metropolitan gravity. But another thing we would like to do is to generalize the method to include also cosmological constants and electric charge. Um, to do, there are some, um, let's say some subtleties in the field equations that we have to deal with and the function f cannot be as general as we would like to, but we're still going in a good direction in this way. So thank you very much. And I'll be here for your questions. Yeah, thank you very much sir, for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, um, are there questions? Uh, Ludovic? Uh, yeah, oh, okay. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for for your very interesting talk. Um, thank you. Uh, you. You may have said it, but probably I missed it. Uh, so in your in your formulation here, you have then uh, the metric and another uh, connection which is uh, which is independent. That's uh, true. So th this uh, this gamma hat. But then uh, when you when you go to the curve solution, what is this gamma hat? Is it zero or because then what you what you give and what you study is just the metric GAB, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is that since the, the Ricci scalar is a, is a constant, you, mm -hmm. you can compute the, the independent connection or in better words, you can compute the Palatini Ricci scalar, which is the interesting quantity. The, the gamma hat is just the, the thing you built the Palatini Ricci scale upon. So you can use this equation. You can trace this equation to find um, to find the Palatini Ricci scalar as a function of the Ricci scalar. So when you choose a function f, you just compute this equation, inserting here Ricci scalar equals zero, and you can find your Palatini Ricci scalar from from this. Okay, then, but then the yes. Uh, what I was no, going to say is that you, you can find an equation. You can do the same the same method that we did here to find this biharmonic equation for delta r. You can do exactly the same and find an equation for uh, for delta Palatini r, and you you can see that the equation is exactly the same. So the mass terms are the same. So if you prove one is stable, the other one is stable as well. Okay, and then the ex the exact form of the gamma hat is really important. What is important is this. Uh, Richie, Richie exactly, stuff. exactly. Okay. Okay. It's just an you. auxiliary quantity, let's say, the gamma hat. Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, so um, thanks uh, a lot, uh, and I suggest we continue. Um, and our next speaker is uh, 
Suvikrant Gera yes. uh, from India, Kharagpur, and he will tell us about emergent magnetic monopoles in degenerate theory. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Suvikrant Gera, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, so I'm Suvikrant Gera, I'm from the Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. So today I'm going to talk about emergent magnetic monopoles in first order theory. So this is the work which I have done with my advisor, Sandeepan Sen Gupta, and it's based on this paper with this archive number. And before I begin, I would like to thank the organizers of the muscle grasp, 16th muscle grasp meeting for allowing me to present this work. So the plan of my talk would be to give a short introduction, uh, which would uh, act as a motivation to the solution that what we are providing and the solution that I'm going to provide has two parts, the exterior part and the interior part of the solution. And then in the summary, I would summarize the results that we got from this new solution. So to begin with, uh, let's start with the most simplest of the magnetic monopoles in the field theory, which is the Dirac monopole, uh, which is given like this. Uh, this is a well-known form and we can find the vector potential of this magnetic monopole and it would some turn out something like this. And from this much information itself, we can see that there are certain issues. The first one being that the vector potential is singular along the line theta equals to pi. Uh, the other one being that the magnetic field diverges as we approach r equals to zero limit. Now, how do we solve these issues? And uh, these issues, the solving of the issue that of r equals to zero divergence leads to non-abelian gauge field width. And the theta equals to pi singularity is removed uh, by defining two different domains. And in these domains, we define two different uh, vector potentials, which are joined by the similarity transformation, which take care of these issues. No, but even after this, the question still remains, why have we not been able to detect any magnetic monopoles in the experiment? Now, one of the possible resolutions to this is that maybe uh, magnetic monopole is not an artifact of field theory, but rather magnetic monopole is an artifact of geometry. And in this, uh, this is not a new idea. And the significant step in this was first taken by Wheeler and Misner, uh, who have defined something called as geometrodynamics in this paper, and where they go on to show how mass, electric, and magnetic charge can be obtained from pure geometry. Now, this idea has certain issues. The first being what they call as the handles. So these are nothing but wormhole-like uh, structures which connect two different regions of uh, your manifold, which basically are their source for their magnetic charge or the electric charge. But the problem being, these are not the solutions to vacuum Einstein equations. The other way around is to define something called as geons, which are quantum particles, uh, which is what uh, Wheeler uses to define the charges in his papers. Now, uh, since these are the known issues with the uh, problems of geometrodynamics, so we then pose the question, is it possible to construct a geometric charge without these issues? And that is the motivation for our work uh, in which we present a solution that is similar to this. Now, if you assume that our space-time has something like a Dirac monopole, and if you want a spherically symmetric solution in Einstein theory, then there is only one unique solution, which is the magnetic riesmann nordstrom solution and which would have its uh, charge, say, suppose here at the origin, and the observer would be asymptotically far away, and there would be an event horizon at R0. Now, what we tend to do is that we want to keep the exterior part the same as the extremal riesmann nordstrom but the interior part, we want to switch it out uh, with something different, a different solution, which would join to this at this boundary R0, which would become the phase boundary. And that is what is, in essence, is what we do with our solution. So to describe our solution, let's first start with the exterior part, uh, which is the riesmann nordstrom solution. As it's known, it's a spherically symmetric solution with magnetic charge. Uh, it would look something like this. Uh, whether you have electric charge or the magnetic charge, it doesn't matter. The solution would look exactly the same because the energy momentum tensor for both of them would be the same. But since we are working with magnetic charge, this charge Q here is magnetic charge. And from straightforward, you can see that it has coverage of singularity, uh, sorry, coordinate singularities at these points, which act as event horizons. And there exists a very interesting case when we take the mass to be the same as the charge, then the horizon, both the horizons collapse into a single horizon, and we get what is called as an extremal case. And we will be working with this extremal case for the simplicity. 
Now to set up our solution, what we do is we take a coordinate transformation of this Reisner Nordstrom and we do such a coordinate transformation where R of u is a function with certain properties. So this u equals to u, u0 is nothing but your horizon here as R goes to Q. And this point would act as our phase boundary between the two solutions. And asymptotically, the R has these properties. Now, once we have this, the solute metric would look something like this. This is equivalent to the Reisman Nordstrom solution in the exterior region everywhere, except at the uh, phase boundary. And now once we have the solution, uh, once we have this metric, sorry, we can define our tetrads and curvature two forms, and they would look something like this. Now, when we want to join two solutions, uh, what we demand is that at the phase boundary where the solutions are joined, all the gauge covariant fields have to be continuous or at, uh, have to be smooth, not just continuous. So to this extent, it's useful to calculate what are the boundary values of the spin connections and tetrads because these are the gauge covariant fields. And we will see that there are only two non-zero gauge covariant, two non-zero tetrads at uh, the boundary, which is E2 and E3. And there's only one non-zero uh, curvature two form, which is given by this R23. And obviously you have the field strength F theta phi, which is Q sine theta at the boundary. So now whatever internal solution that we define, that should give the same uh, gauge covariant field quantities at the boundary. Now with this in mind, what we want to do is we want to switch the internal solution to be a solution of first order gravity. So now to briefly describe what first order gravity is. So this first order gravity is based on the hilbert palatini action, which is given here. And in this, we have two independent fields, the tetrads and the spin connections. And note that in general, the spin connections will have torsion components. We are not taking the torsion to be zero. And upon taking the variation with respect to these independent fields, these are the two set of equations that we would get. Now, what are the advantages of this first order gravity? So the advantage of the first order gravity is, unlike the metric formulation, it is valid for both invertible or non-invertible and non-invertible metrics. Meaning that when your determinant of the metric is zero, uh, you cannot work in the metric formulation. But those are valid solutions here in the first order gravity theory. Uh, is it possible to get the standard Einsteinian theory? Yes, it's possible. When you take the determinant of the metric to be non-zero, and when you assume torsion is zero, you would get back your Einstein field equations. But that's not just this. Uh, these solutions, or as I've said, can admit uh, solutions which are degenerate everywhere or over a region or isolated points, which have been shown in these papers. So with this in idea, we, what we want to do is we want to construct a possible degenerate geometric source for magnetic monopole, which would replace the interior part of your Reisner Nordstrom solution. So to this extent, what we consider is a metric which is degenerate in a time-like direction. And the general metric of those would be written in this particular form. Now, from this, one can easily calculate the tetrads. And you see that the tetrads look like this. And if you want the tetrads to be continuous, uh, smooth at the boundary, we can see that it already sets a condition on the f that f at the boundary should go to zero. And rest will automatically be satisfied because r goes to q at the boundary. Then what you have is that uh, for this part of a degenerate system, the general connection solution is given in this paper and it looks something like this, where omega is the total connection and omega bar is the torsionless part and NKL and M are the torsion fields. Now for the case of magnetic monopole, it's enough to only have the N and you can keep the ML, uh, MKL to be zero. And that's exactly what we do. And we also parameterize the N into this metric form where this, we assume that uh, these fields are only dependent on the u and not on the theta or phi. So once you have this, since now we have omegas and your tetras, it's easy to calculate the field strength. And this is how the field strengths will look like in this case. And from here, you can easily see that if you don't want any curvature singular, any singularities in your field strength, these terms, which I have highlighted, which I have not suppressed should be zero because they have this cot theta term, which would go, which would diverge at theta equals to zero or theta equals to pi. So that's what the condition we get on these fields that gamma should be equals to beta and theta one, theta two, theta three have to be zero. So once you make these simplifications, 
we go back to solving these two set of equations of motion and which we will see that the first set of equation of motion is trivially satisfied and from the second set of uh, uh, second set of solutions we get only one non trivial equation of motion uh, which i have presented here the once you have this uh, you can obviously calculate f in terms of r and the torsion fields and that would give you the most general solution of f now that's what we do and this is what the most general solution looks like now at this point uh, we make a simplification that the alpha beta gamma are constants and when you do that what happens is that this integral which in general cannot be calculated unless you define what your torsion fields are can be solved then and once you solve that you would get the met interior metric to look something like this where uh, the k is given by this and omega has been given by this where k was this integration constant and that is fixed by asking the uh, that is fixed by requiring that r23 uh, which is your uh, the only non zero curvature two form on the exterior should join smoothly so as you have seen here uh, there was this r23 so r23 theta phi this component that has to match that would uh, give me the value of this k and once you fix this both what you will observe is that the denominator of gu uh, the gu term is cubic in r and as such uh, from the algebra of that you can see that it has one real root and let's call it at u star and you will see that the u star has to be between 0 and q hence this forms a natural inner boundary for our solution so this is our solution interior solution that we have right now and what do what happens to the smoothness as i have said that tetrads are smooth by construction and the curvature two forms look something like this with the simplification and these are the torsional fields as you can see since r prime goes to zero at the phase boundary and also f goes to zero as f has a r prime on the numerator so these go to zero hence effectively r12 and r31 go to zero at the phase boundary and you are only left with r23 and this we have matched already to find the constant of integration so this r23 already matches and what happens to this torsion fields as the outside there are no torsion automatically this since these all depend on f these all become zero at the phase boundary so this torsion fields only stay in the degenerate interior region and the only field which you have not the only gauge covariant field which we have not matched till now is the f theta phi and we will get to that but before that uh, how do we interpret the solutions since the metric is degenerate we cannot have the inverse of the metric so we cannot construct any scalar sort of this in the four geometry but what we can do is that we can define an effective three geometry by using the triads which are non zero and using the torsionless spin connections which is what we do and since not torsion is not part of the geometry for any observer or any person who is in this three effective three geometry would interpret this torsion as to be some emergent field matter fields so now the obvious question becomes can we construct a magne emergent magnetic field using this torsion and as we have seen we have already solved all the equations of motion so there is nothing we can get out of there but in gr we have two other identities one is the bianchi identity the other one is the identity that relates torsion to the hodge dual of the curvature two form so we will see that from this one if we consider this particular components which are the only non zero components we would get something like this and now we, what we do is we take a spatial projection of this equation along some uh, internal vector ni and when we do that uh, the equation simplifies into this form now once uh, we reach this form what we can do is we can identify uh, the term on the left side bracket as to be my magnetic field or we can define this as to be my emergent magnetic field and the right side automatically becomes the emergent uh, magnetic charge density and that's exactly what we do and we get a gauss law for this emergent magnetic monopole uh, emergent magnetic field and this is what we have now once we come to this the obvious thing we are is we are interested in the radial uh, only radial magnetic mono, uh, mon, uh, magnetic fields which are radial as we are interested in the monopole so the obvious choice becomes to choose the vector and i the special vector to be a radial uh, radial vector and when we do that we see that there is only one non zero uh, magnetic field uh, component that is br that comes to be as beta r square sin theta and since it's multiplied with the determinant so this is essentially your f theta phi 
and from here he asks that at f theta phi which is basically uh, basically uh, this f theta phi has to match with the f theta phi from the exterior which was q sin theta so when you take that limit u goes to u0 you would see that beta has to be 1 by q so once you do that even the last final non uh, final uh, gauge covariant field the f theta phi has already matched to the exterior region smoothly around the phase boundary and another important feature that you can see is that uh, when you go to the u tends to u0 which is the interior uh, boundary the magnetic field vr goes as 1 by f and which goes to 0 at that point which is in stark contrast with what you have generally with the dirac monopoles which uh, at the origin they diverge so this since this is your internal uh, boundary this acts as your origin in some sense so at this point our magnetic field is completely regular so how do we show that whatever the chart the observer is observing from the exterior region is completely because of this degenerate region so for that what we do is we take a volume integral over the degenerate phase which is at r equals to q and when you do a total volume integral you will see that the uh, total charge turns out to be q which is exactly what the external observer observes so uh to get to the interpretation of this now from the same diagram that i have shown before which is in the u direction with theta and phi i have suppressed so u star is our internal boundary now and the observer stays between u0 to uh, u tends to infinity which is your extremal resonance not strong right now and in this interior region we have a solution which is a, we have a metric which is a solution to first order gravity theory and as we have shown at this boundary u equals to u0 we have matched all the gauge covariant fields namely the tetrads torsion the curvature two forms and even the field strengths f theta phi so the interpretation that you can give is that uh, this geometric source uh, due to the torsion produces an emergent magnetic field which propagates uh, as a normal dirac magnetic field for a uh, observer who is observing outside now can we give a topological interpretation for this charge uh, to that extent what we do is that we construct something uh, like this which is which you can think as a lower dimensional counterpart of the neon invariant where neon invariant is generally a four dimensional uh, topological number and uh, which turns out to be q so in this sense we can say that the external observer who observes the magnetic charge is nothing but the topological neon number that the observer is observing now to summarize the results that what we have uh the field strength uh, constructed from the emergent matter field is joined smoothly to the emergent matter field from the exterior geometry so whatever the magnetic field that the exterior observer observes is actually due to the uh, emergent matter, uh, matter fields in the interior region and though this we have done in the paper due to the constraint of time i haven't gone into this uh we can show that there are no uh, three curvature singularities i mean in the emergent three picture when you use the triads and the curvature uh, the torsionless uh, spin connections whatever the uh, scalars that you construct they don't have any curvature singularities and as i have already shown the magnetic field is also regular everywhere and this approach uh, is a considerable improvement over the approach of Pusner and Miller as it was not a solution to any vacuum einstein solution but these are the exact solutions to the first order vacuum einstein equations also if you construct the if you analyze the geodesics you will see that the geodesics from the exterior uh, exterior region end at the phase boundary hence the seed or the first order degenerate region is inaccessible to the observer but since as f theta phi uh, propagates as the real field for the external observer it is manifested to through geometry so those are the uh, specialities of the solution that we have constructed thank you and i will be taking any questions yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, solution presentation of the solution um are there questions uh, in your time we don't have much time uh, for questions but I would have a question, namely, sure. uh, in just ordinary Einstein gravity, or sometimes uh, when we uh, couple uh, Gauss-Bonnet terms or so have some higher order terms in curvature, uh, we do observe uh, such a phenomenon that uh, first we have uh, solutions uh, 
that are um, have everywhere some fields, young males fields, scalar fields. But uh, in some limit, um, the space time splits kind of in two pieces. And one piece is extremely Nordstrom outside, and the other one is one where the yeah the zero component of uh, the zero zero component of the metric goes to zero. Uh, okay. Can you look at that. Uh, the thing is that uh, the extremal Reisner Nordstrom is for simplicity. We can even do it from the uh, standard Reisner Nordstrom. The mathematics would be complicated, but that wouldn't change the physics. Uh, the only change you would see is that uh, the horizon would be changed from now uh, the R0, which was Q, to something different. Uh, yeah, uh, now, I, I was just wondering whether you see some analogy to uh, those solutions that are well known since, the, let's say, the 90s uh, in, in pure general relativity or yeah, with some other terms. But, but you probably have not looked at that. Um, maybe no, I haven't. Later. Um, I was just curious because uh, I've always been very intrigued uh, by the occurrence of these solutions. Okay, so thanks again. Thank you. And yes. let's continue with our uh, next speaker. So this is uh, Diego Rubira Garcia from Madrid. Hello, uh, so share your screen. And uh, now you will hear about uh, black holes in metric applying gravity properties and observational discriminator. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Please. Yes, yes, it's not yet okay. closed. No, no, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so so thank you for being here for my talk. So so I have uh, well because of the time constraints, uh, well aware of. So so I have tried to be minimalist in order not to overextend my time. So I'm just going to try to com try to convey the idea of uh, well the uh, particular family of uh, extensions of general relativity, which uh, I call metric affine gravity. Uh, I will explain later what, what this is, uh, in case uh, someone in the audience still don't know. I'm going to, to describe uh, well uh, some main results that we have been obtaining in the last few years about the well the, the finding of different black hole solutions in these theories, motivated by theoretical considerations, and uh, at the same time uh, something that we have been doing in the last couple of years, uh, looking right now for. Uh, contact with the observational results in the sense of trying to uh, distinguish these objects as compared to general relativity uh, compact objects. Okay, so this is the idea of what you are going to present. So, so well, uh, so we right now we know that uh, black holes are real objects. Uh, so we have uh, right now two main direct sources of information about uh, black holes, which are rotational waves and and shadows of black holes. So on, on, on their fields, so they have triggered a lot of uh, activity uh, in looking for uh, either uh, additional tests of the Kerr solution of general relativity or uh, looking for signatures of the existence of different uh, compact objects, uh, what is usually sometimes called black hole mimickers or black hole impostors or something like that. Uh, so uh, summary uh, objects which are not the Kerr solution. So something different with uh, maybe black holes, maybe compact objects without horizons, and um, they they have because they have different properties. So maybe there are uh, in these uh, gravitational waves of shadows there are some ways of uh, looking for uh, new signals of these objects to decide whether we have a Kerr black hole or something different. Okay, so the Kerr black hole or Kerr Newman is the, the the most general so axisymmetric solution of Einstein equations. Uh, only three parameters. This is very well known. The physics of this uh, solution is perfectly understood. And uh, according to what have we what we have right now, so uh, the expectation of this solution uh, perfectly fits with what we observe. Okay, so they do uh, the, the same do other compact objects, but uh, Kerr black hole. Uh, by now uh, is compatible with all observations. But this refers only to the physics outside the event horizon or the kerr Neumann solution. But uh, if, you know, if this solution is, is the right one describing the, the, also the inner region of, of black holes, 
So then one uh, immediately sees that there is something something off in, in the solution. So um, if you take, uh, this is very well known, if you take the, the simplest example, Schwarz solution, so in the line element, there are two potentially problematic uh, problems. So one of them is simply the horizon, and the other one is the central singularity, as we can confirm by the, the divergence of curvature scalars. So because of this, because uh, in all classic solutions, black hole solutions of general relativity, so Schwarzschild, Riesen, Nostro, and Kirk Newman, we have uh, curvature singularities. So there is a trend on the field uh, to uh, remove uh, these singularities uh, or extending the, the Kerdima solution by other solution without curvature divergences, uh, as we saw in the in the previous uh, in the previous talk. Okay. So uh, in this sense, so because mm, in in all classical solutions of general relativity uh, of uh, observational interest for astrophysics, uh, I mean, in the case of black holes, we have singularities. So. Uh, at the heart of general relativity, predicting these solutions the lies the, its own demise in the sense that there are uh, singularities which are unavoidable. Actually, that singularities are unavoidable is a basic result uh, of uh, not of, of the art itself, but of the uh, singular, uh, singularity theorems developed in the 60s, which, curiously enough, uh, they don't make use uh, of curvature divergences at all. Instead, they make use of the idea of uh, geodesic completeness. Because uh, since geodesics are associated to the free fall motion of physical observers or to the, of the trajectories of light, of light rates, so demanding geodesic completeness means it's a natural restriction for your space time because it means that uh, all trajectories of these particles and these light rays will be indefinitely extended. And now, as it happens, uh, so these theories and singularities tell us that uh, actually, uh, if these three conditions that appear here hold, so the existence of, uh, of geodesic incompleteness uh, is unavoidable in our classical solutions of black holes. And because of this, uh, despite its, its observational success for the exterior part of black holes, predictability and determinism are threatened in general relativity by the very existence of these objects. So it seems natural uh, to, from a theoretical point of view to try to improve the internal region of a black hole uh, by replacing it by something, while at the same time leaving the physics outside of the horizon mostly unaffected in order to pass current constraints, but at the same time leaving a little, a little space in order to uh, check for deviations uh, with respect to the Kerr solution. So this is the, the trail of thought that we follow. And so uh, the, first, uh, the first challenge is to uh, replace the internal uh, region of black holes by something. And in order to do that, either you do it with compact objects inside general relativity, or you extend general relativity in one way. Uh, this is what we do. And when you go to this, to, to this area, so you, you discover that there are a, a lot of competing approaches according to your personal pre or philosophical preferences. And there is not a complete agreement on how these extensions should be done. So there are a lot of different approaches, many of which, uh, as resulting from the combined observation right, of gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation from the merger of a binary system of a neutron star and a black hole. So many of them, because of the of several uh, of the constraints of the propagation of the gravitational waves at the speed of light, has uh, has been a killing machine for many of these extensions. You know that is. So I said in here a, a canonical paper on this subject where they, they include a table with a, with uh, a number of theories that, uh, that cannot survive this observation and others that would survive and then you can keep doing your research about that. So uh, this is the, 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 the place where our research move, uh, is located. And as I said, uh, our idea is to look for uh, extensions of general relativity that gives you uh, naturally to the existence of non-singular black holes, and uh, as a first step, and as a second step, look for prospective uh, observational deviations of these solutions as compared to general relativity that we can use in order to test whether our solutions are viable candidates to represent the, the, the Kerr solution. So our approach is called the metric affine approach. Uh, this is actually very simple. It's just to keep metric and connection independent, which they are actually. So they are independent mathematical and physical objects that 
by a, a, a by, by the shape because the general relativity uh, the action is the einstein hibbert lagrangian so in that case of that action the when you find the, the field equations associated to to the metric and the connection the one of the connection tells you that your connection is given by the levitsky beta one okay so uh, even if you do not take your connection to be given by the levitsky beta from the very beginning the field equations of your theory will give you at the end of the day, the levitsky beta connection at the solution of your connection equation. But this is only for uh, einstein hibbert and for the Lovelock family. If you consider other theories of gravity, this is not so. The connection will have its own set of equations that you need to solve in order to find what is the connection in your theory. And in our, uh, and in our case, we, we consider in order to, to restrict the space of metric affine theories. So we consider a subclass of it which is basically those that are built as scalars out of the contractions of the metric with the symmetric part of the rigid tensor and minimal coupling in the matter fields. Okay, so the connection does not appear on the matter, but it does appear on the rigid tensor. And because metric and connection are independent, so you perform independent variation on reaction with respect to both of them, and you get two sets of equations. Okay. And then you need to solve the connection equation in order to, to for a particular theory to detect what is the, the, the connection of your theory. So there is a number, a number of caveats of this uh, construction. So first of all, we set torsion to manis, which is valid as long as uh, you deal with bosons only, which is the case of this talk. If you deal with uh, fermions, so things uh, complicate a little bit because you need to, to include it here in the matter uh, sector, the, the, the whole of the connection. We also consider the symmetric part of this object, not anti-symmetric, because if you consider the anti-symmetric part, so you immediately face a problem with the existence of cause like instabilities, as explained in this paper, uh, which will be there unless, unless you adapt additional torsion fields in order to, to, to cancel this uh, cause like uh, degrees of freedom. So examples of this family of theory, so it's general relativity, of course, with the contraction of Gminu with Arminu to, to build the, the scalar, uh, the, the curvature scalar, but also the theories F of R, uh, contributions in the Ricci square, born in Felix gravity theory, so different theories that are uh, inside here. Now, the field equations, as I said, there are two sets of equations, one for the metric, another for the connection. Uh, so one will think to solve the equation for the connection and then uh, with the connection build your equations for, for, for the metric. Uh, this, this way is not very practical uh, uh, and it's much better not to do that, but instead observe that in the, in the equation for the connection, you can always rewrite it as uh, uh, in, by introducing a new run to tensor, Q -new, that satisfies this equation, which is the standard. Uh, equation for uh, which uh, for for a levitsky beta connection. So in the sense, the independent connection is levitsky beta of this new metric Q, and this new metric Q is related with the space-time metric G, the one appear appearing here on the on the coupling of the matter fields times a uh, some kind of matrix. If you are in four dimensions, so this is a four times four matrix uh, regarding uh, relating these two metrics. And the relevant point that allow us to do this transformation is that. It can be shown for any uh, RBG theory that this matrix that appear here can always be written as a function of the inner momentum tensor of the matter fields. So these two metrics that appear here are functions of the of the inner momentum tensor fields. And because of that, everything that appears here on the right hand side is a function of the matter fields. So what you have here, G mini of a metric associated to the levitsky beta connection and additional couplings in the matter fields on the right hand side. So this is general relativity. General relativity with uh, new couplings in the matter fields on the right. Something that we know how to solve, uh, and then we can solve it in order to, to obtain the, this uh, new metric Q. And once you have this new metric Q, invert this relation in order to get your space time metric G, which is the solution of your, of your theory. Okay? So this procedure works very well if there is uh, enough amount of symmetry. Uh, I will comment later what, what happens when you don't have enough amount of symmetry. But this is the, instant, the, the case for static solutions. For rotating, it's a bit more complicated. I will explain it later. So you can obtain many different uh, static solutions uh, for different theories of interest, for far gravity, quadratic gravity, for infra gravity, and so on. And then you can uh, study whether they are singular or, or not. 
in order to do that, uh, using the idea of geodesic completeness, so you get a spherically symmetric metric like this one, write the associated uh, geodesic equation with the two conserved quantities, energy and angular momentum, K4 is zero for null trajectories, minus one for physical observers. And then typically, uh, a, a given RBD geometry will be encoded into these two functions that will take this, uh, can be written this way. Okay, so at the end, this equation can be rewritten this way with an effective potential of this point. Uh, so this is something that you can uh, now use very easily in order to study whether your solutions are geodesically complete or not. And then you just need to integrate it and see what is the shape of this function omega one that appears here. And depending on this, on the behavior on X, uh, so in the behavior omega one and R squared, you basically, for, dif for different solutions, you get the same uh, kind of singularity avoidance mechanism, which are these two. There are only two, essentially. Uh, one, uh, in one of them, uh, what happens is that the boundary of the space-time is uh, displaced to an infinite affine distance. So any geodesic will take an infinite time to, to get to it or to depart from them. So the space-time is geodesically complete because of that. Because the, the potentially problematic area cannot be reached to infinite affine time, so your geodesics are complete. In the second scenario, your geodesics can get to the center of the, of the solution in finite affine time, but they can be naturally extended to the other side of the, of the center of the solution, uh, typically via a, a, a bounce in the radial coordinate, if you are in, in cosmology, via a wormhole in the case of, uh, in the case of um, black hole solutions, but uh, you don't need any violation of binary conditions in order to do that because you are not in general relativity. And in particular, uh, in these solutions where you can get to the center in finite affine time, there might be equivalent to their variances, but they do not necessarily destroy physical observers because they are weak enough in order not to affect uh, in a pathological well physical observers. That's something that we also uh, prove uh, in some of these papers. Okay, so this is for static spherical asymmetric solutions, but from an observational point of view, we are more interested in uh, cotating ones. Now, there, is, there comes a problem with the procedure I was explaining here, in the sense that we're saying that here, uh, everything depends on the matter fields, okay? But that's not exactly true. In general, it will depend on the matter fields and on the space-time metric G that will appear on the right. But you have field equations for Q on the left. So you need to replace uh, Gs here in terms of Q using this matrix. And actually, this can be done. Uh, it uh, gives you a mapping of theories in the sense that if you have uh, some RBE coupled to some matter fields that will be described by this action, you can systematically remove all the G minus dependencies that appear here in terms of key minus dependencies using this transformation. And at the end, what, the, you, what your uh, theory is going to be written, so you have your RBE uh, described by a metric G and some matter fields as I am. At the end of the day, you can rewrite it as GR for a metric Q, which will be this one. And here will be some set of matter fields of, uh, with additional couplings. And everything has been rewritten in terms of Q. So this is GR plus some new matter fields with a hat, depending on Q. And mm, uh, this allows you to establish a correspondence between this GR with these matter fields and this RBG with these new matter fields. So it allows, so this means that if you have a seed solution here described by some matter fields, once you establish, once you give an RBE theory, you can obtain solutions of this theory, uh, from solution of this theory, you can obtain solutions of this theory just working out the relation between these two sets of matter fields. Or on the other way around, if you want to obtain a solution of this, uh, of RBE with some matter fields, uh, this correspondence will tell you what is the equivalence in GR with some new matter fields. Look for a solution of this, of this theory in general relativity. And once you have it, which is usually simpler, via uh, these algebraic transformations, you get the corresponding solution of this, of, this, of this thing. So in particular, we use this procedure in order to find uh, an exact rotating black hole solution in einstein borenfeld gravity out of the Kerr-Neumann solution of general relativity. And this solution, which is exact, is this one. Okay, so there are new contributions here. So this term, this one, this one, this one, uh, and this one, and this one, they are new. And they depend, uh, that's another feature of the RBG theories, is that the, the, the new corrections to general relativity solutions will appear uh, 
driven by the, by the energy density of the matter fields, which is what, what you have here, the energy density of the matter fields. Okay. And once you have this extra solution, you can stand, uh, start studying uh, phenomenology uh, for any particular problem of interest. Uh, actually, these guys here recently uh, did something that we intended to do, which is study lensing of the solution. So they did it in an analytic way. So, so we were not quick enough, but we have been exploring other uh, options in order to apply this correspondence. And in particular, we were particular, uh, interested on looking, because as you can see, depending on the, on the size of this parameter, the corrections to the ergosphere, uh, to the gravitational waves description, and so can be very, uh, uh, can be, can be very small. So it's not easy to, to, to discriminate the prediction of this theory regarding uh, lensing or shadows or gravitational waves as compared to general relativity. So we were looking for something uh, that is uh, new in this theory, some qualitatively new property of, uh, of these uh, RBG theories that do not appear on the general relativity counterparts. And one of them was something that has been called double critical cures, which are associated to the, to the, uh, to the uh, unstable circular orbits of photons around a black hole. In Schwarzschild, uh, you have one. In Kerr, you have two, but they are associated to the rotating and co-rotating. So it doesn't be simply a single cure. So you restrict to a spherically symmetric black hole. In Schwarzschild, you have one, but here you, uh, you can have two or more than two in different compact objects. So the question is whether there are uh, any well-behaved theory uh, of the where um, that contains well-defined uh, uh, solutions with good properties like positive energy density, uh, com uh, compatibility with the current observation and so on. Uh, and in particular, there are three solutions of this kind. Uh, one of them is asymmetric wormholes where uh, the effective potential on each side of this true is different. So in this case, you can see, so there are two sides in the, in the third of the black hole. So there are two maxima of the, pot of the effective potential for photons. So these two maxima are two critical cures and will induce the generation of two uh, light rings associated to these two maxima. In Schwarzschild, you only have one uh, regarding this problem. And in, the, in, the, in, in this construction, you will have two corresponding to the impact parameter values of the, of the fine parameter when you are inside this, this region. So this one, the external one will be the one of the Schwarzschild. And this, is, this will be another one induced by photons that travel from here in the direction, hit the potential here, and came back and produced the, this. Uh, this new light ring. The point is that this construction was suggested in, in this paper in a model independent way, but the question was whether it's possible to obtain it from some particular model of modified gravity. And this is possible in RBE theories. Uh, so, so in particular, if you consider uh, thin cell wormholes requiring them to be stable under perturbations and supported by positive energy matter sources, which are reasonable requirements, so you find that you can get the solutions. So this is a particular implementation uh, with a well-defined model of uh, this idea that was uh, raised here in this paper. But this is, uh, well, here the colors are uh, grossly exaggerated. So this is not a real aspect that a new photon ring will have. Uh, in order to, to work out the real aspect of, of these photon rings, you need to, to go to a realistic model of a creation disk. Uh, because the main illumination of the of the of your compact object will be provided by some kind of this. Okay, so in the in the particular case where you consider geometrically and optically thin creation this, so there there has been a renewal of of uh, of activity regarding this by this essentially by this paper of Grala, Holtz, and Wald, where uh, they, they they show up that uh, the, the the contribution of the of the uh, to the total luminosity of the of the photon ring of the critical cure uh, can be uh, almost diminished. Uh, I mean, almost dismissed because it's very low. Uh, actually, the, what you can see in the shadow is not the photon ring emission, but uh, the, the direct emission of light radar has been uh, suffered has suffered a, a slight deviation, and that the photon ring associated to the to the maximum of the potential actually is barely visible. You, actually, if you zoom in here, it's it's not this red one. It's, there is another one inside which is associated to the photon ring. So the photon ring plays no role in the total luminosity of the object. Uh, uh, actually, they were contesting some claims that appear on the HC original paper about this thing. And as you can see, uh, depending on the model of accretion, so the shadow of the object can be uh, very different. 
Here, the photon ring is very visible, but it's there. Uh, here, mm, is, is, it cannot be seen because it's overlap with the direct emission and the same happens here. Okay, so the shadows can be very different depending not only on the background geometry, because we are using this background geometry of a one hole. Uh, and as you can see, with the same background geometry and the same uh, parameters on your, on your model, depending on the creation of this model that you use, the shadow can be very different from each other. And this can be much more in string in other models of, of workhorse. Okay. So, so, okay. So, just to, to conclude, because I'm running out of time. So, uh, so the idea of, of this research uh, that comprises a lot of different, uh, uh, different results and papers is to use. Uh, the space-time singularities, and in particular, is removal in well-defined models of uh, metrical fine gravity as a theoretical guidelines in order to build your new families of solutions. And once you have them, uh, try to uh, find observational discriminators, either in terms of shadows or in terms of gravitational wave emission. And in particular, we have been playing uh, recently with uh, using these uh, shadows uh, in these two examples in order to look uh, for observational discrimination in terms of double critical cures as compared to the, to the, in this case, to the Schwarzschild solution, but of course, this will be generalized to, to include rotation. And there are other observational, other observational discriminators, not uh, for black holes, but also for other kind of stellar objects, like the existence of limiting masses between, uh, uh, for instance, the Chamber mass or the uh, main sequence mass in order to put limits on the gravitational theory. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much um, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have time for some brief uh, question. Um, I don't see any, but uh, at least uh, one of my questions I have is uh, how do you precisely pick then uh, this transformation? So you have one GR solution and mm -hmm. now um, you want to go to a specific uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you call them uh, richie based uh, uh, gravity. Uh, so, what precisely tells you then this connection? Okay, so the idea is to get this equation, which is uh, Einstein tensor on the left for a metric Q. But here you have things on the right that depend on G. So, you remove all these dependencies in G in terms of dependencies in Q. So, you will have G e mu of Q equal to some t mu with hat depending on q. So this is general relativity, coupled to a hat uh, matter fields with a hat. Okay. So uh, this mm, this system of the equations and this equation also allows you to work out the relation between the densities and the pressures of your model. And once you have this, so the the metric g mu that appears here can be inverted. This relation, uh, not always, but in many cases, can be inverted in order to tell you. What do you metric g mu, which is the one appearing in RDG, uh, as a function of k mu, which is the solution of your theory, once you have given your set of matter fields? So this will give you your k mu multiplied by the inverse of this matrix that depends on the any momentum tensor of the matter fields. But this equation allows you to get the relation between the, 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 the energy density and pressure of the matter fields. So this is the, the, the thing that you plug here. In order to have the, to have this relation, you need also to say what what where what what, what is your theory. Uh, with yes. your RBG yes. theory, because the, the shape of the matrix of this matrix will depend on the energy momentum tensor of the matter fields, uh, whose specific form will will be RBG dependent. So once you fix your RBG theory, for instance, in F of R, this omega is simply the derivative of F with respect to R. While in volume field gravity, it's a bit more complicated. So once you have this, and when you establish your set of matter fields, you can work out the relation between densities and pressures, which are the ones that appear here. In this matrix, and inverting the relation, you get the solution for a G mu. So actually, once you get the sort out the, the technical details, finding a new solution is uh, actually quite simple. Yeah, I, I must say I, I find this really amazing. It's a uh, yeah. yeah, very very interesting, great work. Uh, um, so this makes it very uh, tempting to start looking for GR solutions. <laughs> and see how they are going to behave uh, in- Yeah, this is what we did here in order to, to yeah, get a rotated yeah, solution. Precisely. Starting with a known solution in general relativity in order to map it into the RBG side. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's, in, it's not possible to find an analytic solution of this kind. Yes. 
Yes, amazing. So uh, thanks again for this very interesting uh, talk. And uh, I will now hand over uh, to Kamal and uh, he'll continue with our next speaker. Uh, okay, uh, thank you uh, to the other speakers. Uh, so far, we had very nice talks, and also thanks, Yuta, for the nice moderation. Without further ado, we go to the next speaker, who is Masoud Ghazalbash from Canada. He's going to talk about holography for rotating black holes in F of T gravity. Please. Uh, okay, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to uh, do this talk about holography for rotating black holes in above T gravity. This is a work that was done with my uh, former uh, graduate student, uh, Kanishis Bernard, and it was uh, published in Physical Review D. So just I say something about this holography, which is now we know it's a very important part of uh, description of quantum gravity. Um, normally it's uh, called Kerr CFD correspondence. And uh, the idea is that if you have a rotating black hole and it's extrema, um, then uh, if you go to near horizon, on the near horizon of the black hole, we can find some uh, states and physical quantities. And these physical quantities corresponds to a conformal field theory that describes uh, exactly the physics inside the black hole. So instead of uh, talking about inside the black hole and a speculation about what is going on inside the extremal black hole, extremal rotating black hole, we just can look at the CFD on the, on the, on the horizon. And uh, the idea is that all information that we have inside the black hole has an image on, on, the, on the horizon. So conformal field theory can detect and see everything that happens inside the, inside the extremal black hole. Uh, the idea is very powerful and it's applicable almost to any extremal black hole in uh, Einstein gravity. However, if we have a non-extremal black hole that supposedly most black holes in nature are not are not extremal, then uh, we cannot use this, uh, this care CFD correspondence. And uh, later I will mention why this happens. When uh, we have the non-extremal uh, black hole, then there is one other method that we can look at it and try to find uh, the hidden, to find a conformal field theory on the boundary, which is which is known as hidden conformal symmetry. It's hidden because we cannot see it directly. We have to see it indirectly, as I will um, uh, describe it later. So to do uh, one example, I consider the Kersen black hole. This is a black hole which is obtained from compactification of a string theory to four dimension. So um, um, the metric is given on the top of the page. Uh, then uh, this metric is accompanied by a dilaton field, or it's better to say a scalar field. And then we have a Maxwell field with component AT and A5. And also we have an anti-symmetric uh, second rank tensor B. So it's a very rich uh, black hole structures in, uh, with uh, several uh, matter fields. The mass of black hole is uh, related to mass parameter M and parameter alpha. And uh, the charge of black hole, the same is related to mass and parameter alpha. Um, and if we set by the way alpha equals zero, it reduces to care black hole. Uh, the angular velocity of horizon and uh, Hawking temperature are given by these equations. And uh, the angular momentum of black hole uh, is MA, which is the typical angular momentum of a Kerr black hole, but now it's modified by a Cauchy square, uh, alpha. And the horizon of black hole is located at this value. That uh, rho is uh, the ratio of square of uh, charge divided by mass of black hole. Uh, we don't want any naked singularities, so we put this inequality 
between mass, charge, and the angular momentum of the black hole. And we can write the temperature and angular momentum of black hole in terms of J, M, and Q by these equations. And uh, finally, the thing that really we are interested in, because we want to describe it by conformal field theory, is the entropy of black hole, which is given by this long equation in terms of mass, Q, and J. And remember, I said that this holography works very well when the black hole is extremal. So extremality means that in the inequality equation that we have on the top of this page, we have to consider the equal sign. So when J and uh, mass square and charge square are related by this equation, we have extremal black hole. If I plug this equation in the entropy of black hole on the above line, you can see that the entropy of black hole is really just angular momentum of the black hole up to a factor of two pi. So this is all gravity, okay? And now the question is, could we obtain any of these results, especially entropy, because uh, really we know that that's most important property of a, of a, of a black hole. Uh, in view of its thermodynamic properties, we, could we find from quantum theory of gravity? And the answer is yes. And not only we can do this result that I show in the next slides, but also we can find the entropy of uh, Kerr Newman, Kerr Bolt, Kerr Bolt ADS, Kerr Sen, other five and higher dimensional rotating black holes such as BMPV black hole in 5D and equal to supergravity by this method. So this method is very robust. And up to today, we haven't seen any, any contradiction to this holography for extreme all rotating black hole. So uh, yeah, remember I mentioned we have to go near horizon of black hole. So to do the near, to find the near horizon geometry of this extremal black hole, which horizon is located at M minus rho over two, we do this uh, coordinate transformation. And uh, then the metric turns out to be uh, that complicated expression in the middle of the page or on the bottom of the page. And if we look at the metric very carefully, we see a copy of two-dimensional ADS. And this is the first sign that something is going on here. Always we know that ADS2 is associated with a two-dimensional conformal field theory. So we should be happy. And uh, by the way, I, this is the near horizon dilaton, uh, near horizon gauge field, and near horizon uh, three form field strength. Uh, we can't get any inspiration from, from these expressions. They are just so complicated. Uh, the only thing that we get is from that ADS2 in, in the near horizon geometry of the, of the black hole. Um, I do one other uh, coordinate transformation and uh, we change the original R Tau and phi coordinates to y, t, and phi coordinate. And the metric that I showed before for the near horizon now looks like that. Again, we can see the, a copy of ADS2 and uh, S1 bundle over ADS2. So the near horizon geometry is really an ADS2 that at each point of ADS2, we have a circle bundled over, over ADS2. And this geometry, it's known for a long, long time that ADS2 geometry has a SL2R isometry. And also we have a rotational U1 isometry, as we see that phi, that bundle, the S1 bundle is, has a rotation, shows a rotational U1 isometry, which is generated by the killing vector D phi. So, so yeah, we see that the near horizon geometry of rotational black hole, um, sorry, consists of a copy of ADS2. And um, uh, I mentioned we have a U1 isometry. We can, we can enhance this U1 isometry to a Virasoro algebra. Okay, and the Virasoro algebra is given 
in the very last line of this page. Uh, LM and LN are the generators of virostor algebra. And we can see that we have a very, very non-trivial central charge. The second term in the right-hand side of the equation shows the central charge of the Virasur algebra. So we can read off the central charge, which is 12 times J divided by H bar. And uh, in uh, conformal field theory, if we have a two-dimensional conformal field theory, this is a known fact that the, the, the field theory has, a, has an entropy, has a cardi entropy. The cardi entropy is uh, related to the central charge of conformal field theory and the energy of the conformal field theory. Uh, we can find the uh, energy of conformal field theory from the first law of thermodynamics the middle line in this page. And uh, we can see that uh, L, the energy of conformal field theory is proportional to T squared, uh, the temperature of the conformal field theory multiplied by C. And if we put everything together, we get the right equation as the entropy for the, the Cardi entropy for the, for the conformal field theory. So, there is, uh, we can find the temperature of the conformal field theory. It's one over two pi. I found central charge in previous page. Yeah, this central charge 12J over H bar. So I plug everything together and we get the microscopic CFD entropy, the Cardi entropy. And amazingly, it's exactly equal to Bekenstein Hawking entropy for the Kersen black hole. So this is amazing, a, a, a boundary theory, a, bond, a theory just on the, on, the, on the horizon of the black hole knows exactly what happens inside the black hole. We get exactly the same entropy. This is not the only thing that conformal field theory shows and we get perfect match between uh, Wittgenstein Hawking entropy and the Cardi entropy, but there are some other evidences. For example, if we find a, a scattering of the particles from the black hole, we can find the results from, from the gravity side exactly by conformal field theory side. And also if we find the correlators of different perturbation, the field perturbation in the, in the near extreme all black hole, and we find these correlators from gravity, from Einstein gravity, we can get exactly the same result. Exactly, when I say exactly, I mean there is no approximations at all. We, get, we can get it exactly from, from the conformal field theory. So that's, that's the perfect thing. So the conclusions are uh, that for extremal uh, holography, the near horizon states of extremal black hole can be identified with a certain uh, chiral two-dimensional CFD. The Virastor algebra is generated with a class of diffeomorphisms that uh, preserve an appropriate boundary condition, the near horizon geometry, and the most important point that really led to all of this amazing result is that the near horizon geometry consists of a copy of ADS structure. And this ADS honestly gives, gives the, the, the existence of conformal field theory on the boundary. So how about generic non-extremal black hole? If we have a non-extremal black hole, then uh, the near horizon geometry is not ADS, that's the problem. And instead it's a Rindler space. And we know that Rindler space doesn't have any association with the, with the conformal field theory. And to find the conformal field theory that we call it hidden conformal field theory, we look at the uh, equations of some uh, probe fields, like uh, we put a, we put a probe field like a scalar field or a spinor field in the background of this non-extremal black hole. And we try to find the conformal field theory from the, uh, from the solutions of, of this probe field. And everything is working in the Einstein gravity. And this is not the main topic of my talk. So really I want to start my talk right now uh, and talk about the gravitational trinity. We know that GR is completely equivalent to TEGR or STEGR. They are two alternative theories of gravity that the Ricci scalar is replaced by torsion scalar or with uh, non-metricity Q. And these three, three theories are completely equivalent in any sense. 
But we know that GR is not enough to describe the nature, and we need to replace uh, GR by a theory f of r gravity that uh, Ricci scalar is replaced by any function of r. The same way we can have three other theories, f of t and f of q, and then there is no trinity. These three theories are completely independent of each other, and by no means one of them, um, by no means they are equivalent. So all uh, every, every of these te three theories have a lot of applications. For example, f of r is a very good extension of GR to describe the dark energy and dark matter. Uh, F of T is an extension of uh, TEGR, and uh, which uh, instead of using the levi civita connection, we use the, we use the Weissenbach connection. And from this uh, Weissenbach connection, we build, uh, it, it leads to, to the torsion. And uh, the extension of STEGR is called F of, Q F of Q theory. Q is the non-metricity. And in Q just simply, uh, you know, in GR, the covariant derivative of metric tensor is zero. But uh, in general, we can, we can relax this condition. And Q is related to the deri covariant derivative of G mu nu, which is not zero now. So if that we set covariant derivative of G mu not zero, which is called the non-metricity, then we can find f of q. And now the interesting question is that um, if we have the same thing, could we have the, um, because f of t gravity is completely different of f of r, and already we know that we have holography in Einstein gravity, it's a very legitimate question to ask, what happens for holography in f of t gravity? So this is the, the, and the action for the, F of t gravity, lambda is cosmological constant, F is Maxwell field. The Weissenbach connection is given by this equation. And from the Weissenbach connection, we build the, the torsion tensor, T alpha mu nu. And uh, the, to the scalar torsion is given by equation T, the second equation in the middle of the page. And uh, Tensor S is defined in terms of the Weissenbach connection uh, and, uh, and uh, contortion tensor K. And we have, so we consider this type of um, F of T, uh, quadratic F of T gravity, T plus alpha T square. The gravity field equations is given in the middle. The Maxwell's field equations are the same as before in Einstein gravity. And there is a black hole solution. By the way, there is not too many, there is not too many known black hole solutions in F of T gravity. So this is one of them that I mentioned here. This black hole solution is in the cylindrical coordinates. Z is the z-axis, R is the radial coordinate, T is time, and phi is the angular. Uh, uh, angular um, coordinate. Uh, A of R is given by this expression. We have term of R square, one over R, one over R square, and one over R six. This black hole has six horizons. B is related to A by the second equation in, in the middle of page. Beta is given in terms of alpha and Q. Q is the charge of black hole. M is the mass of black hole, of course. And uh, lambda effective um, is different from the cosmological constant. Lambda effective is the inverse of alpha. And this is the Maxwell field, phi tilde, or phi. Uh, the torsion of black hole is given by the equation. The entropy of black hole is here. So it's not only a quarter of area, but it's multiplied by F prime of T. And we need it, so we calculate it. The <coughs> excuse me. The area of horizon is given by this simple expression. And if we plug it back in the entropy of black hole equation, we get this the first line in, in this page. It's a long expression for the entropy in terms of the outer horizon charge mass and alpha parameter. And there are some graphs that shows entropy is behaving very well in, 
different uh, versus different parameters of the black hole. And now I want to see, do we have any holography for this black hole or not? And because the black hole in general is non-extremal, I consider a massless scalar field in the background of this black hole. Psi is the massless scalar field. Thanks to three killing vectors that we have for the black hole, I can write Psi by this expression in terms of just one radial function. The other three, the three killing vectors imply that the, 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 the time dependence, Z dependence and phi dependence must be just some exponential functions. And if I plug this back to the, to the scalar probe equation, we get uh, the next equation, which is a second order normal ordinary differential equation for R, for radial function. And V by the way is a potential, which is given by, by the last line in the page. Now we go to the <coughs> near horizon region and we can approximate A of R with a quadratic function. R plus is the outer horizon. R star is not horizon. It's related to R plus, but it's not horizon. And uh, I use this approximation for A of R. I plug it back into the previous equation, the radial equation that we see. And we get the equation here in terms of uh, calligraphic A, B, C, they are given by a and B are given here, and C has a similar structure. Uh, I consider these three uh, vector fields, H1, H0, H minus one, and they generate SL2R algebra. And um, also I consider another set of generators. So we have two sets of generators and they make uh, SL2R times SL2R algebra. So this is the building algebra for the two-dimensional conformal field theory. And why I'm interested in this algebra? Because if I calculate the Casimir of this algebra, the Casimir is given by the very last line of in this page. This is the Casimir operator. And uh, Remember that the Casimir is in terms of omega plus, omega minus, and y, they are three uh, conformal coordinates. I choose uh, omega plus, omega minus, and y by these three equations. So I choose the conformal coordinates in terms of uh, the black hole coordinates, t, phi, and r, or uh, black hole parameters. Omega plus, omega minus, and y are the conformal um, coordinates and I plug these three omega plus omega minus and y coordinates into the into the Casimir operator and what we find is very very interesting we get this equation <clears throat> and why this equation is interesting because if you compare this equation with the radial equation that I showed before this equation or sorry this equation the, the equation in the middle of the page, they are exactly the same. So it means the Casimir operator of an algebra knows about the radial equation that we got it from gravity, from f of t gravity. They are two independent theories, but the conformal field theory, the Casimir operator knows about the the radial equation coming from f of t gravity. So the equation in the middle is exactly equivalent to the last equation in this page if we choose proper temperature TN and TR and proper NL and NR. They are the conformal field theory quantities <coughs> that I show it here. So if we choose the temperatures given by this equation, the first two equations, and the mode numbers of CFD, by the other two equations for NR and NL. <coughs> then, uh, and when we plot them, we, we plot them in the cardi entropy for the CFD, which I derived it earlier. This is the general formula for the entropy of any black hole. 
uh, if I plug them, <coughs> by the way, there are some graphs that shows uh, the uh, temperatures uh, of sorry, the so, 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 I'm so sorry, Marcel, we are a bit uh, out of time. If, if I don't see the page numbers, if it is possible, just say. Uh, you know, oh, I'm almost uh, done. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm almost done. Okay. So <clears throat> these are the graphs that shows the temperature of black holes. We see all the temperatures are positive and uh, well-defined. And uh, if we choose the central charge of the black hole by this equation, we find that the Cardi entropy that I showed here, the very last line of this page, produces exactly the uh, entropy of, of the rotating black hole in, um, in F of T gravity. So we conclude that uh, the holography not only works in Einstein gravity, but also it works for uh, F of T gravity. Uh, thank you uh, very much for this nice talk. Um, very uh, fast questions, if there are. Uh, I have a very uh, quick question about that entropy uh, proportional to the angular momentum. Do we expect that this entropy proportional to angular momentum would be correct for the charged black holes? Because I realize that you are talking about Kern Newman or some charged black holes or something. Could you please make, uh, make a comment? Uh, you know, it depends on the extremality condition that you impose on the entropy. It depends on J for this black hole, for the Kersen black hole. Uh, for the Kerr black hole, yeah, we have the same equation. I, I guess for Kerr Newman, we have the same equation. If we go for extreme all Kerr Newman, we have the same, uh, the same equation. It's not general, you know, it's not a general equation that if you have a rotating black hole, it's extreme all rotating black hole, its entropy always is equal to J. But at for least the, for Kerr. For the extremal right, right and all this one, we don't have entropy equal to zero. I mean, if J is zero, the entropy would be zero, but for the extremal rise and all the it's not zero. Anyway. Uh, think... Yeah, that, the, this holography just works if you have a rotating black hole. So you cannot apply it to rise and all or you cannot have- I was just thinking change. about the limits. Uh, okay, uh, maybe I should look <laughs> more, more carefully about, about this. And thank you for the talk. Uh, let's go to the next talk. Uh, which is going to be uh, Nikodem uh, Popolovsky from uh, US, uh, from the University of New Hafen. He is going to talk about the universe is in a black hole with spin and torsion. Please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present my research in this conference. I will just start sharing my screen uh, from beginning. Okay, now it should be okay. So I just uh, want to briefly introduce Einstein Cartan theory of gravity. It is the uh, very natural and one of the oldest extensions extensions of general relativity, uh, which, uh, which uh, assumes that, I mean, it removes the constraint on FN connection because it is an assumption that FN connection is symmetric. It removes it. FN connection now contains anti-symmetric part, which is called the torsion tensor. And this torsion tensor is a variable, just like the metric tensor, and we have to use principle of least action to uh, find the uh, field equations. Uh, einstein cartan uh, uh, schema kibble gravity is the simplest theory with torsion because the Lagrangian density is exactly the same as in general relativity, except that now Ricci's scalar depends on the FN connection in the same way as uh, in general relativity, except that now uh, uh, torsion is not zero. So FN connection has extra part, which has to be varied. Uh, so varying the Lagrangian with respect to 
uh, torsion tensor or contortion, which is a little easier, that's a linear combination, gives the Cartan equations. The Cartan equations actually are algebraic linear equations. They, uh, they say that torsion is proportional to spin density, which means in vacuum, torsion is zero which means in vacuum, and this is like solar system or like, like uh, most of the predictions of general relativity are automatically satisfied by uh, uh, Einstein-Cartan theory. Uh, however, uh, uh, um, now if the spin tensor is not zero, then torsion is not zero. Uh, now varying the Lagrangian with respect to the metric tensor gives the Einstein equations, which are modified. Uh, and uh, both sides of Einstein equations are modified. Ricci tensor is modified by terms with torsion and so is energy momentum tensor. We can move all the terms which come from torsion to the right-hand side of the equations and use the Cartan equations to replace torsion with spin. And then we can recast the Einstein-Cartan equations uh, in the general relativistic form when Einstein tensor is proportional to the regular energy momentum tensor plus the correction which comes from spin and this correction is quadratic in spin density and kappa square kappa is proportional to gravitational constant so this correction is, is very very small actually it's very very small uh, actually the einstein cartan equations give the difference from general relativity at densities approximately 10 to the power of 45 kilograms per meter cube which means even in neutron stars Einstein Cartan theory is indistinguishable from general relativity. We need Einstein Cartan theory only when density is much bigger, uh, when they would like to become infinity, like in singularities. I want to show that basically Einstein Cartan theory will remove, will remove singularity. So, spin fluid, uh, Dirac uh, spinners which represent fermions, they couple to torsion because the because the uh, torsion tensor is part of covariant derivative of a spinner, so Dirac-Lagrangian will be linear in torsion. So spin density uh, will be automatically generated in the presence of fermions, so fermions generate torsion. Uh, so uh, writing, uh, uh, making the spin fluid approximation, which is valid actually at point particle approximations, uh, 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 Einstein Cartan equations can be uh, written as Einstein Cartan equations for ideal fluid with extra correction. So here's the energy density, here's the energy, den energy density and pressure of the fluid for velocity. And those are the extra corrections. Those corrections uh, come from the average square of the spin density and they are negative. So basically, uh, Einstein Cartan equations give, uh, uh, give, um, uh, the negative correction to energy density and pressure. So here, those are the equations. And actually, they can be put with some constants. Those corrections are proportional to the square of the of the uh, fermion number density. Okay, so now, uh, standard model by Tolman of gravitational collapse of fluid sphere. So we take the Einstein equations, we use the Tolman metric, and we write the Einstein equations. So this is the standard textbook, Landau Lifshitz classical theory of fields does it. Uh, so basically, we can get this. Uh, and then we can write co covariant conservation of energy and momentum. So there is like a lot of, uh, so there's some details. I, I, I put it here. So uh, for interested uh, uh, viewers uh, to see videos later, uh, you, you can watch the details. But basically uh, what happens is that uh, if you consider pressure as homogeneous, then we can actually simplify the metric and metric becomes like this equation on the bottom. Uh, and this uh, metric is a, simplified Tolman metric depends on, uh, you have two functions lambda and little r and they depend on tau they depend on tau and big r uh, and basically big r counts the uh, uh, in the index indexes the particles so big r equal to zero it is the center of the sphere and big r uh, uh, subscript zero is the outside of this, it is the surface of the sphere. So this is the metric in the collapsing sphere. So here are Einstein equations for this metric. Then basically the standard procedure is 
to integrate those equations. Now, so without pressure, it is the Tolman solution. Uh, what I did here, I assumed that pressure is not zero. And why? Well, because there is this correction from pressure coming from uh, torsion, this negative correction. So this is why uh, I wanted to go uh, something more general. So basically here, uh, uh, integration of uh, action equations gives the time derivative of little r. Uh, little r is the radial distance uh, from the center of the sphere. And uh, so there's like a lot of uh, uh, analogy with Tolman model. It is just little extended by the presence of pressure. But basically, I just want to get to the point. Uh, uh, actually, here is on the very, very bottom, there is the citation of the paper uh, published earlier this year. And it's also an archive. So it's published in Russian and also in English. Um, so uh, if we assume that spin fluid is composed of ultra relativistic matter, then we can replace energy density and pressure in, in terms of temperature. So here's the equation how Little r, little r is the radiance distance uh, from each particle from the center of the collapsing fluid. Big R counts the it, it counts the particles. T is the temperature. Uh, prime is derivative with respect to big R. Dot is derivative with respect to tau. Uh, tau is the time variable. So basically, making all these mathematics uh, and also introduces uh, some var variable a. Uh, variable A is defined uh, here, basically as R is proportional to A times sine of R. Uh, this is kind of resembling the Tolman work, but uh, extending to the pressure, we get equation for little a. And actually, uh, this uh, uh, variable A satisfies the same equation as closed universe. So basically, this is the known result that Tolman uh, collapse of the sphere uh, uh, can be considered as the part of closed universe. However, there is this negative term. This negative term in equation nine comes from the spin uh, correction. And this is negative term. And it is also inverse proportional to a to the power of four, which means when a becomes very, very small, which means when the fl spin uh, uh, fluid sphere collapses, little a cannot become zero. Because if little a in equation number nine becomes zero, then the right hand side of this equation would become negative and left hand side is positive. So a cannot be zero, which means little r from equation six cannot be zero, which means particles cannot reach the center, which means uh, technically singularity is avoided. Uh, but uh, there is also, okay, I'll, I'll skip this. Actually, uh, uh, you can actually rewrite the metric in terms of new variable A, and exactly it looks like Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric. Uh, but here's the equation, basically, the same equation nine. Uh, and uh, I just told you already that the value of little a cannot uh, reach zero uh, for the reasons I already mentioned. So singularity is avoided because of torsion coupled to spin. And it's, uh, it has to be replaced by non-singular bounds. So after the bounce, the matter, uh, after avoiding singularity, it just reaches some very hot and dense state with very high temperature. And then it has to bounce back. But the matter cannot go back to the event horizon. Event horizon forms normally, uh, just like in a black hole, because uh, 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 torsion becomes very, very significant only at super, super high densities right uh, 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 after, after event horizons forms. So black hole forms, there is no difference. It is only near the singularity what, what, what is changed. Singularity is avoided uh, and the non-singular bounce happened. And after the bounce, the matter cannot go back uh, to the uh, through the original event horizon, because the motion is only one dimensional, which means the baby universe is created. So the idea which was done already like 40 years ago, I think Patria was the first, Novikov and Patria were the first to suggest that. Uh, and some people investigated. My little contribution was just to explain that torsion in einstein cartan gravity could explain uh, black holes becoming a wormholes, basically, and making a baby universes. Uh, so, however, there is all, one more thing, because um, torsion provides a condition to preventing a singularity, but it's not necessary because there's also a shear. Shear, so, so correction of torsion to energy density scale like a to the minus uh, six. 
a to the minus six uh, uh, energy density, uh, re regular energy density is like a to the minus four. So torsion actually uh, prevents singularity if there's no shear. The problem is that shear also scales like a to the minus six, which means, uh, and torsion actually in Raishaduri equation opposes uh, the tor uh, 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 shear. So shear enhance singularity, torsion prevents it, but they scale at the same rate, which means if torsion initially is weaker than shear, then it will be weaker all the time and singularity will be uh, created. To avoid singularity, something has to defeat shear. But there is a beautiful thing, particle production. So all to research by Parker, Zeldovitz, Starobinsky in the 60s, Hawking, particle production in strong gravitational field. Fermions can be uh, created uh, by strong gravitational fields. And if the fermions uh, are created, so actually, uh, actually, uh, by assuming some uh, the simplest phenomenological uh, particle production rate, which means here's the how the fermion density is produced by uh, uh, in co-moving frame, it is proportional to the fourth uh, power of Hubble constant. This is just the simplest dimensional analysis uh, formula and beta is production rate, which is the only unknown number, which is like phenomenal uh, unknown it's a free parameter so that's the only free parameter so basically uh, this and uh, this uh, uh, number density grows a little faster than shear by this little delta so basically the point is that particle production and torsion together can beat the shear and the bounce will be created so uh when uh, uh, when we co collect two, those two equations, Friedman equations for universe, here's the first Friedman, equa Friedman equation, which I showed before. And here's the equation coming, which is equivalent to the uh, 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 particle production. This is in terms of temperature. So basically what happens is that, uh, um, actually, here's the closed universe. This is the analogy. Uh, closed universe is basically the two-dimensional uh, closed universe is three-dimensional three surface of four-dimensional hypersphere. Uh, so this is like an analogy of the balloon in one extra di one more dimension and scale factor is the balloon radius. Basically, here is the last thing I wanted to show you. Uh, this model also uh, explains inflation. So not only big, uh, singularity can be avoided and uh, black hole creates baby universe, but also inflation because uh, this is equation uh, uh, how temperature changes in time depending on this particle uh, 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 production rate and H is the Hubble parameter. What happens is that, so in the, in the contracting phase, when the black hole wants to create a singularity but does not because of uh, torsion prevents it, uh, uh, particle production uh, uh, supports torsion uh, to, beat, uh, to defeat the shear, so singularity is avoided. But after the bounce, in the expanding phase, now uh, this is how temperature changes basically, uh, this term here is increasing and it can uh, it increases from zero after bounce, it can reach one. This term, which I point right with the arrow, can, can never be bigger than one because then we would have eternal inflation because then temperature would be increasing with scale factor. So this is the limit on beta. Uh, however, if beta is chosen in such a way that this term becomes almost as big as one, but not bigger, then uh, left-hand side will zero, is zero, which means temperature becomes constant. So actually for a very short period of time, temperature becomes constant and so does energy density. And that's inflation because inflation is the, there's the expansion with at constant temperature at constant energy density. So for very, very short time, uh, there is a exponential expansion of the universe but then it lasts only finite time because after that torsion becomes weaker and uh, this exponential expansion ends this term this term uh, which i showed you the arrow here uh, goes below one again and then eventually goes to zero and then the uh, universe in the black hole becomes like uh, radiation dominated so basically, and here those are the citations of the articles on the bottom. So we have finite inflation. And actually, uh, because closed universe uh, would, uh, without dark energy, closed universe would reach the maximum size and collapse back. So uh, without dark energy uh, uh, and without particle production, universe would be oscillating. 
However, because of the particle production, each cycle uh, takes longer and reaches the bigger size. So the universe you see like in the picture, like those little cycles uh, uh, have like next second cycle is bigger and, uh, and longer. However, when the universe is big enough, after several cycles, it may reach the size where the cosmological constant becomes dominant. And then according to the Bondi model of closed universe with dark energy, universe will have inflection point and will expand to infinity. So basically right now, if this is true, if our universe was born in the black hole, then it might have several cycles. And now we are here because now we reach the size when dark energy is now dominating. Uh, so this is basically the idea that, well, maybe every black hole creates a new universe and our universe originated in a black hole. So this would solve the problem of our universe. Now, of course, what happened to the parent universe, we don't know because now those are the nice questions like what happened before and what happened to the grandparent universe and so on. It is, uh, so here are my acknowledgements, uh, Gabriel Unger, Jordan Cubero, Michael Del Grosso, my students, University Research Scholar Program at University of New Haven, Dr. Desai, uh, who uh, did some simulations with me of the cycles. Here are the references and just without saying loudly, here's the summary of my research. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you for the interesting talk. Is there any questions, comments? Um, Please, Yuta. May I just ask uh, this? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this interesting talk. But uh, when you have now this uh, new uh, model for inflation, did you uh, also calculate whether you would get uh, the density fluctuations that you would need for a cosmic microwave background? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the great question. So actually uh, here is the citation of uh, my article with dr shantanu desai in physical uh, like uh, the third the third line from the bottom uh, is like uh, oh, here with the arrow uh, what we did is that we took those equations the friedman equation with torsion and also the second equation how temperature changes with the scale factor and we uh, what we did was, because uh, in inflation, uh, in comparison of inflation models with cosmic microwave data, uh, I think that standard like slow roll inflation parameter are used. Uh, so what we did was that we found what would be scalar field which would give, uh, which would give equivalent dynamics as our model with torsion. So we, we don't assume any scalar fields, but we ask the question, what would be the scalar field which would give the same dynamics? And actually such, such thing was done by Ellis and Madsen. There is the article which basically, uh, 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 which uh, uh, reproduces the form of scalar field from any dynamics. So we followed this article to reproduce. We found out equivalent scalar field and we applied we calculated uh, a tensor to scalar ratio and spectral scalar index, number of e faults, and we, we found so in this article, the third from the bottom, the side, and myself, we found that for some range of this part of this particle production rate beta, uh, uh, those results are consistent. So basically. I would say microwave background data does not prove, but does not disprove yet. So there is, but I think that future data, and as you mentioned, like those, like, like perturbations, and, and they, probably, they probably will be more. We want to do more. We want to constrain more to see if we could get like very small range of particle production rate, which would be consistent, or maybe we can exclude that. So, uh, so preliminarily, we have some comparison with the data, but we want to do more. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We are 15 minutes uh, out of time, so we go to the next speaker, Renan Agarhaus from Brazil. And thank you to the speaker again, sorry. Okay. And he's going to talk about absorption by the front black holes. Uh, thank you. Can, can you hear me and see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, so I will start, I will try to be uh, very quickly. Uh, so today we'll talk about absorption by deformed black holes. Here is the outline of the presentation. Uh, 
the recent and uh, the recent gravitational wave detections and and the first image of a black hole shadow uh, provide new channels to test the gravity in the strong field regime. Uh, comparison of the observations with numerical simulations made within general relativity uh, shows very good agreement up to a few percent. Uh, however, there are a number of extensions of general relativity that that produce uh, solutions uh, with the same behaviors of general relativity black holes. Uh, unfortunately, to find solutions of alternative theories uh, is not the easiest task to deal with uh, cumbersome equations with high nonlinearities. Uh, in this sense, it could be more convenient to work in a model independent framework describing the most generic black holes in any metric theory. Uh, the idea is similar to uh, parameterized post Newtonian framework, uh, but in this case, the, the solution is valid in, in, in the whole space outside the event horizon. Uh, here are some uh, papers uh, which propose some parameterizations. The, the solutions that arise from, from this framework are called parameterized or deformed black holes. Uh, an important aspect of black holes that can be used to study them is how they absorb matter and fields around them. So that to study the absorption and scattering cross-sections uh, is interesting to, to, to know how uh, these additional parameters influence uh, in the vicinity of the black holes. And this is basically what you do today. Uh, uh, and today we will analyze one of, of these parameterized solutions, uh, in, in particular the Econopolis Denko black hole. Uh, the the, uh, the Denko black hole was, was proposed uh, in a rotating uh, form to, to show that uh, two black holes can uh, cast the same uh, gravitational wave signal. Uh, today, to see how these additional parameters that appears in, in the Konoplas Denko black hole, uh, as, a, as a first insight, let's uh, analyze the non spinning version of this metric. Uh, the Konoplas Denko black hole can be obtained uh, by the Chivashu black hole, uh, introducing some parametric deformations in, in the mass term of the solution uh, given by the equation two. Here, these uh, eta i are the so called uh, deformation parameters. And when these parameters vanish, uh, we recover the Shivashu solution. Uh, in, in principle, we have uh, uh, an infinite number of parameters, but uh, use, imposing some constraints, we can uh, reduce uh, the number of these parameters. Uh, here, we will consider uh, a solution that that have uh, only uh, that that has only one uh, deformation parameter, namely eta. Uh, and this corresponds to the line elements of the static version of the Konoplas Denko black hole, given by the equation three. Uh, this space time here is pretty similar to the Shivashud one uh, far away the event horizon, but uh, near the event horizon, the, the formation parameter uh, plays an important role, and the and the solution can be quite different uh, in in this uh, region. Uh, this space time uh, has uh, an event horizon and the location of the event horizon can be found by evaluating the, the equation four. And this is a cubic equation. So in principle, it has three different hoods. And here uh, I show uh, these three different hoods. And as we can see, we have uh, two, two positive solutions, uh, two real and positive solutions uh, for the previous equation, namely R1 and R3. Uh, R1 is the, the outer, uh, Event uh, outer horizon and the R three is the inner horizon. Uh, so uh, R two uh, R one is interpreted as uh, the the event horizon of the space time. And as we can see here, uh, we have a minimal value of the deformation parameter eta, uh, so that uh, for smaller values of the deformation parameter, we do not have an event horizon. Uh, we can also see in this figure here that as we increase the value of the deformation parameter. The, the location of the event horizon increases. Uh, so that uh, for positive values of the deformation parameter, the location of the event horizon is uh, bigger than uh, 2m. And for negative values of the deformation parameter, the location of the event horizon is smaller than 2m. Uh, associated with the event horizon, we also have uh, the, the surface area of the, of the black hole. And 
And again, as you can see here, uh, the, the area of the black hole increases as you increase the value of the, the formation parameter being uh, uh, bigger than the, the Shiva shield area for positive values of the deformation parameter and is smaller than the Shiva shield area for negative values of the deformation parameter. Uh, here we are interested in to, in to analyze the absorption process of, of, uh, of these black holes and, and we consider the spin zero field uh, in the vicinity of this uh, space time. So that the, the massless Klein Gordon equation is satisfied. And due to the spherical symmetry, uh, the massless scalar field can, can be uh, written in the, in the form of equation seven. Here we have a, a radial function, and here we have the spherical harmonics. Uh, using this decomposition, we can, find the, we can find the equation for the radial function uh, given by the equation eight, where here this V is the effective potential that as we can see by equation nine vanishes uh, at the event horizon and at the spatial, spatial infinity. Uh, introducing the tortoise golden age, we can rewrite the equation H as a should be like equation uh, that is free of first order derivatives. And we can plot the effective potential in terms of this tortoise golden age here. And here I show uh, the, the effective potential uh, for known negative values of the deformation parameter and known positive values of the deformation parameter. And as you can see, uh, as we increase the value of the deformation parameter, the peak of the potential uh, decreases and is displaced uh, to, to the right. And as we, as we decrease the value of the deformation parameter, the peak of the potential increases uh, and is displaced uh, to, to the left. Okay, and we can also see here that the effective potential vanishes at the, at the event horizon and at spatial infinity. Uh, so we, we are interested in the absorption process. So we will seek for solutions that are purely incoming waves at the event horizon and a composition of ingoing and outgoing waves as, at spatial infinity. So that the, the radio function must satisfy the, the conditions given by the equation 12. Here, this curly R and curly T uh, are related to the reflection and transmission coefficients and satisfy the flux conservation law given by the equation 13. Uh, okay, the absorption problem consists in to evaluate the flux of particles absorbed by the black hole. Uh, and we can define the absorption cross section uh, as the ratio between the number of particles absorbed by the black hole and the incident particle flux. If we use the partial wave method, we can uh, write the total absorption cross section as a sum of partial absorption cross sections defined by the equation 15, where here we have the presence of the, of the transmission coefficient. Uh, the total absorption cross-sections uh, was very uh, explored in the, in the literature and in the low and high frequency regimes, uh, the, the, the massless scalar, scalar absorption cross-section uh, has uh, well-known behavior. Uh, in the low frequency regime, the massless scalar absorption cross-section goes to the area of the event horizon for any stationary black hole spacetime. And in the mid to high frequency regime, uh, it was shown that the total absorption cross section can be written as given by the equation 16, uh, that basically oscillates around the, the classical absorption cross section. Uh, this is known as sync approximation. Uh, so, but, but here we are interested in, in to find the, the total absorption cross section uh, for the whole range of frequencies. Uh, so we define a new radio function to, to uh, solve the, the radio equation numerically. Uh, and defining this function here that satisfy these two uh, conditions at the event horizon and these two conditions at spatial infinity, we solve the, the uh, radio equation uh, close enough uh, the event horizon to a sufficient, sufficiently large value of, of the radio coordinate uh, given by this R infinity here. And the the, this uh, sufficiently large value will depend on the, on the value of the L mode. Uh, but after we, we solve this uh, equation numerically, we can use these two equations here to uh, write uh, uh, expression that relates uh, the transmission coefficient with the radio function and the derivative of the radio function at uh, spatial infinity. 
uh, and this uh, expression is given by the equation 23 and we can plot it uh, for several values of the of the frequency uh, and here I show uh, this for some values of the deformation parameter and as you can see as you increase the value of the deformation parameter for positive values uh, the the transmission coefficient increases and as we uh, decrease the value for negative values, uh, the, the transmission coefficient decreases. Uh, this is more appreciated for uh, bigger values of the L mode, as, I, uh, as we can see here. Okay, so with uh, this transmission coefficient uh, evaluated, we can uh, calculate the total absorption cross-section. And basically, we find that the total absorption cross-section for the static conopless Denko black holes uh, has this uh, behavior here. Uh, the solution oscillates around the, the classical absorption cross-section here denoted by these uh, horizontal dashed lines. And as we increase the values of the, uh, the value of the deformation parameter, uh, the total absorption cross-section increases. Uh, and when we decrease the value of the deformation parameter, the total absorption cross-section decreases. As I said, uh, in the low frequency regime, uh, the total absorption cross-section goes to the area of the, of the event horizon. So that it's convenient to plot the total absorption cross-section, uh, normalize it by the area of the event horizon. And as we can see in the low frequency regime, uh, the total absorption cross-section goes to the area of the correspondent, um, of the correspondent uh, black hole. And this ratio here decreases as we increase the value of the deformation uh, parameter. And when we consider negative values of the deformation parameter, this ratio here uh, increases. And again, in the low frequency regime, uh, the total absorption cross-section goes to the area of the black hole. Uh, here, we compare the sync approximation uh, with uh, our numerical solution, and we find excellent agreement uh, in the mid to high frequency regime. Uh, as you can see, the solution uh, oscillates around the, the classical absorption cross-section, uh, here norm normalized by the area of the black hole. And, and uh, it is known, but here uh, I will point it out that uh, the, the sync approximation doesn't work in the low frequency regime. As we can see here, the sync approximation uh, uh, doesn't go to the area of the black hole. Uh, so some Final remarks, uh, we considered a uh, massless scalar field in the vicinity of static conopless Denko black holes. Uh, we solved numerically the radio equation uh, to, to basically evaluate the scale absorption of uh, static conopless Denko black holes. And we find that in the low frequency regime, the total absorption cross section of the static conopless Denko black hole goes to the area of the corresponding black hole. And in the mid to high frequency, uh, it oscillates around the, the classical absorption cross-section. And when normalized by the area, it increases as we uh, diminish the value of the deformation parameter. Uh, we also checked our numerical results with the, the sync approximation, finding an excellent agreement. Uh, here uh, are some references and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Renan, for this nice and interesting talk. Uh, any questions we have? Uh, Maybe one minute for one question. Uh, maybe I can ask a very fast question. How this analysis is related to the black hole shadow? Can you say something about the shadow of this black hole? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in the static case, uh, the the shadow of a black hole basically uh, can be obtained by the the classical absorption cross section. Because uh, this this uh, this thing here is related to the critical impact parameter. Uh, so uh, basically, we have the shadow of these black holes uh, just evaluating this this uh, quantity here. Uh, but when we we want to consider uh, astrophysical black holes with uh, rotating parameter, uh, we need to to uh, take care of of it and. We need uh, other other things, but basically, in the static case, we we already have the the, the shadow of this uh, space times uh, just by considering this uh, quantity here. Okay, thank you very much. 
uh, if there is not any question, uh, thanks to you again. And let's uh, go to the next speaker, who is uh, Javier Badia from Argentina. He's going to talk about shadow of charged black hole surrounded by an anisotropic matter field. Please. Okay, thank you. So yes, I will be talking about black hole shadows, that is shadows of uh, rotating charged black holes surrounded by an isotropic matter. So first to give some context, what do I mean here by an isotropic matter? What is just matter with an, an isotropic pressure, uh, which if we follow what, what other people did and chooses to be a perfect fluid, we have a stress energy tensor of this form in spherical coordinates. Where to preserve the spherical symmetry, we don't, don't have completely an isotropic pressure. We have one radial pressure, P1, and one in the angular pressures, P2, which we in the theta and phi directions are the same. And we also assume a barotropic equation of state, which is very, very standard, where the pressures are proportional to the energy density. What is the motivation for considering an isotropic matter around uh, a black hole in Einstein gravity? Well, for one, it allows a, a static solution where the matter is supported by its pressure and it doesn't fall in into the black hole. And for this to happen, we need to have negative pressure. Specifically, the radial pressure needs to be equal to minus the energy density of the fluid. So the W1 has to be minus one. And isotropic matter also shows up in some Wernerhold space times. <coughs> and interestingly, the metric one gets for this, the black hole metric, which is a solution of the system, has a very general form, and I will show what I mean by that in a minute. But it can also, for example, arise in some alternative theories of gravity. In fact, I think it includes the one we just saw in the previous talk. I'm not sure, I have to check, but I think it does. And also, I think gravity with other kinds of matter, other kinds of fields. So the solution, this is first the spherically symmetric black hole solution, and move on to the rotating one later, which was not found by us, was found by other authors. It's very simple, it's like this. It's very straightforward to, besides having the matter, the anisotropic matter I mentioned, to add electric charge to the system. So we have something that looks very much like the reisner nostrum metric, which would be up to here in this mass function, but with an extra term coming from the the energy of the anisotropic matter with a constant of integration k related to the energy density of the anisotropic matter. And you can see that the, the parameter w, which remember sets the relates the equation of state, the relation between the angular pressure and the energy density shows up here in the exponent. So this is what I mean by having a very general metric. With a somewhat uniform physical origin, you can change the parameter w and get different kind of, kinds of power law terms here in the mass function. There are actually some restrictions you can look at given by the energy conditions, which restrict the possible values of w and asking that the total energy contained in the, in the matter for you, in the anisotropic matter is finite, but we will not obey those restrictions because we are interested in the shadow uh, the shadows of these, these black holes. And the, the energy conditions are not really very, very relevant for the calculation of the shadow. The, everything works out all the same. So we will just consider all values of W, but one has to keep in mind that when considering the physical interpretation of where the metric came from, well, this might be relevant if you, if you care about that. And another comment is that this Q is obviously the electric charge, and so Q squared is positive. But the solution works all the same. The metric still makes sense if Q squared is a negative number. That is, if we replace Q squared by just small Q, which can be positive or negative, this just gives us more generality, more a bigger space of metrics to look at with essentially the same calculations. Obviously, if Q is negative, if small Q is negative, it won't be coming from an electric charge, but it can arise, for example, in brain wall gravity or other theories. From this, one can apply the Newman-Janis algorithm and derive a rotating version of the metric. 
which is really just very much like the curve metric, but with this different mass function, just like the, the non-rotating metric is like the Schwarzschild solution, but with different mass function. So really not much change is there. Again, Q can remember can have any sign. And the only restriction we'll impose on W is that it is positive, which uh, is a condition to have a nice and relatively flat space time. And uh, for simplicity, we will set the mass m to be equal to one so that everything is dimensionless because everything is proportional to the mass or powers of the mass. We can also quickly mention the existence of event horizons because that is important for the shadow. So for a standard Kerr Newman black hole with only electric charge, we know that the combination A squared plus Q, which would be A squared plus Q squared if it's electric charge, has to be less than one in order to have an event horizon. Well, these plots show the parameter space in, in K and W for different values of, of this combination where we have an event horizon, where this is the, the white part. The, the gray part is corresponds to naked singularity, so we will not be looking at that. And the interesting thing is that we can go above the curve bound, right? By being in this, in this area, we can have a spin and charge greater than one or greater than the mass and still have event horizons. One caveat is that this region here where W is greater than one and K is positive on so these three plots requires negative energy. That is the energy density of the anisotropic matter becomes negative. So again, uh, if you're looking at the, the physical interpretation of where this came from, this could be, of course be problematic. But that doesn't ha happen here, where W is less than one, and you still can have very fast rotating black holes, for example. So I will go over very quickly over the, the standard method to find the shadow of a metric like this. I won't really get into the details because I really want to go to the results. The standard method works whenever the hamilton chagabi equation for geodesics is separable, which it is in metric like this one. It is in fact in a very wide class of metrics of which this one is a special case. And this allows you to bring the equations of motion to first order form like this one, like here with these, these potentials R and theta, where we see three constants of motion, the energy and angular momentum, which are the of course, come from the axis symmetry and, and time invariance of the, the metric. But also you have the Carter constant Q, which is it's hidden. It comes from the so-called hidden symmetry, which actually comes from a killing tensor, not a killing vector. It's called hidden because, well, you wouldn't expect it at first. Uh, it shows up when you when you work out the hamilton chagabi equation and manage to separate it. And it exists, its existence is what allows you allows you to completely separate the equations and bring them all to first order, first order form. Now having this, the next step is to look at the spherical photon orbits. That is the, the trajectories of photons that are a constant radius, which are just the solutions of the radio potential and its derivative equal to zero. And you can solve that. It's not all that complicated. Uh, you def the usual thing is to define these quantities, psi and eta, which are called the impact parameters which has just the, the angular momentum and the current constant normalized by the energy. And you get these expressions, which are parametric expressions. So for, for each value of R, if you want a photon orbit at that radius, you need to have the, the impact parameters given by these equations. Uh, the the allowed range for, for R is whenever eta is positive, this is something that can be shown, which leads to the photon region, the region near the black hole where you can have actually spherical photon orbits. Now also a standard argument shows that <coughs> for an observer far away, the border of the shadow of the black hole, the trajectories that are the border between those that fall into the black hole and those that escape to infinity, are trajectories with the same impact, impact parameters at this, as these orbits. So these, these expressions also give us the black hole shadow, or rather its border, if we relate them to 
what observer sees in the sky, which is given by these celestial coordinates, alpha and beta. So given uh, the inclination of an observer, and we will also always consider an equatorial observer because it's where the effects are seen more, most clearly. You, you take these parametric expressions, you plug them in here to get parametric expressions for alpha and beta, and, you know, and then you plot that and you have the shadow. So I have here some examples of what the shadow looks like for various values of the parameters. We see the standard effect of a rotating black hole shadow, which is displaced to the side, here to the left, and is slightly flattened on one side. This is the effect of the rotation of the print dragon. Um, but one issue with this metric is that it has many parameters, right? Even after fixing the spin, you still have three, the WK and the charge Q. So it's not easy to, to see what happens to the, to the shadow as you can vary all of them. It's a three-dimensional parameter space. So to help with that, we define some observables. That is some quantities that are defined from the shadow, that are from its, from its geometry, geometry, sorry, that um, characterize it, its size, its shape, and so on, to have a more abbreviated, so to speak, some, some information about the shadow that is not just a, a list of many plots. So the first one we look at is the area of the shadow. It's the most straightforward one, which is shown here plotted as a function of Q for some values of the parameters. You can see that it has a pretty uniform behavior, right? It decreases as Q increases. This is already very well known for the Kerr Newman black hole, a larger charge gets you closer to the extremal black hole, and this leads to a smaller shadow. And also decreases as k decreases, which makes sense since, since uh, if we return to the metric function f of r, which shows up in the metric, q and k appear with opposite signs. So of course, it's very, very reasonable that increasing q and decreasing k will have qualitatively similar results on the shadow. More interesting, perhaps, is the other two observables. So first look at this left side for a minute. One of them is the oblateness, which, is, which measures how far the shadow is from being circular. It's the horizontal diameter divided by the vertical diameter. And again, as the charge increases, it gets smaller. The, the shadow becomes more less, less wide than it is tall. And the position of the center of the shadow, which moves to the left to negative values as the charge increases. But there is also this interesting thing happen here in the regions for very large charge. We remember we can access without running into naked similarities because of the, the presence of the matter, which leads to these slightly weird shadows. For slightly higher Q, you can see that first the obladeness becomes greater than one. That is, the shadow becomes wider than it is tall. And if we keep on going and keep increasing the charge, it moves to the other side. The position of the center becomes positive and the shadow moves to the right of the optical axis, which at least to me is the most surprising part. Because like I said, the fact that the shadow is displaced to the left comes from the rotation of a black hole, from the frame dragging, which affects the orbits of photons differently, whether they orbit one way or the other around a black hole. So somehow, the gravitational effect of this anisotropic matter is working against that. I don't really know why. Maybe it's because uh, it's a region of negative energy. I guess that would make sense, but I haven't, I don't know if that really works as an explanation. But I think it's interesting that at some point this, this very universal behavior is reversed. So to sum up very quickly, because that is really all I have to say, uh, we considered um, an isotropic matter surrounding a black hole, a rotating black hole, in fact, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of those is that it leads to a, a very general metric with a, with a power law where the exponent can be mostly everything, at least if you don't care about energy conditions. 
we can separate the hamilton chagavi equation with this metric, which is good because we can use the standard method to analytically find the, the shadow. We have plotted the shadow. We can plot it for any parameters we want. In particular, we, def we have defined some observables which help us characterize the shadow and analyze it uh, as the parameters change. Some of the behavior makes sense, is expected, and also we have find some regions where some things are the opposite of uh, what we usually expect. So that is all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Javier, for this very interesting talk. Uh, is there any questions or comments? May I? Please. Um, thank you very much for this uh, really uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering uh, when you um, uh, make this uh, Janus uh, Newman uh, transformation, uh, does the solution that you end up with uh, correspond to a solution of the field equations? Did you check that or did you just uh, make the transformation? You mean the, the Newman Janus algorithm? Yeah, yeah, Newman Janus, sorry, yeah. No, we have not checked it. Uh... It is indeed an issue that this is a good question because uh, it's not guaranteed you know, uh, that the Newman Janis algorithm leads you to a solution of the same field equations. So, no, this has not been checked because it's really not easy at all to check uh, rotating solutions. Um, but yeah, the... that, that's right, of course. But uh, when you have the field equations, um, <clears throat> It can sometimes be done. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, I know it can be done. Um, I'm, yeah. It's not actually yeah, that I, hard. I was to just check them. Uh, it's just it's hard to find. Yeah, sorry. It's hard to find the solutions. It's not all that hard to check them. Um, um, but still, we think the the physical interpretation works the same. I mean, in the sense that it it could happen that this is not the solution of the original field equations, but it would still be a black hole metric with all these characteristics, which could be a solution of perhaps another uh, theory, another kind of matter or theory. Uh, but no, we don't, we don't yes. have any, we, I, I, can, mm -hmm. I cannot tell you that it, it is a solution. Mm. Yeah, I, I fully agree. It's very interesting whether it's a solution of the original theory or some other theory <laughs> and uh, the shifting. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. It might be due to negative energies. It's most interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it's been okay. nice to find out where this is really the, the reason for that. So if uh, there are no more questions, uh, we have the floor uh, uh, viewed out for the closing the session. And thanks also from me. Thanks again for this very nice talk today from the other speakers. Yes, so thanks from me as well. It, it's been a very interesting session and thank you all for the very nice contributions and the discussions. So have a nice evening and or nice day, <laughs> depending where you are. Okay, so bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.